With Racontarista, episode number 3,874.0005. Yeah, and if you're counting in star years. There you go. Yeah. It's a Star Trek. Light day. years. We're, you know, we're in the light years. If you're a Trekkie, you know exactly the date I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know right. the date? Yeah, 17.32. It, it was the one where Ahura had the cleavage. That was Ooh. the date that we saw Ahura's cleavage. So, man, it hurt. Good, I mean, good I, date. Good date, man. Good date. I really, really like those. Uh, you know, that was the first interracial kiss. It was. Yeah. It was. I mean, I love. I mean, if they're when they're wearing those, those. How, man, how can you? How can what's you Kurt not? supposed to do? The guy's uh, full of testosterone. A little, a little felt, a little felt there. Yeah. You know, on that. Hey, Donna. Hi, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to shut the window so you don't have to hear this. But uh, are you kidding? You know. This is a tree. <laughs> what the fuck are you? If you don't have any more faith in us than that, then get the oh. fuck out of here. <laughs> no, she, she hears this all the time from me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, she, like, you, know, you were asking one day, you go, does she listen to the podcast? and go, every fucking day of her life. <laughs> As I'm talking. <laughs> That's was, I was laughing the day because I go, I saw Rand Paul was, you know, giving Fauci shit, right? And he, he, Dr. Fauci goes, oh, and he said, it's political theater that you showed up here today with two masks on, and you've already had a, you know, vaccination. And, and you know, Fauci's going, look, man, it's just being common sense and just, you know, doing the right thing and all this stuff. And Rand's up there. I started looking up and going, Where's, what's his name, Rand? I look up, his real name is Randall, right? But his wife is the one that called him Rand, and so he started going by the name that his wife called him, his, his little nickname. And I started laughing. I was going, I would never go by the nickname that Donna would call me because I think my name would be, hey, would you shut the fuck up? I think that would be my name. Yeah, anytime somebody says shut the fuck up, you'd perk up like a dog. <laughs> what? What? Yeah. You salivate like a Pavlov's dog. <laughs> hey, let's don't talk about it. it no, it's not Rand. It's, it's because it's the last name of that cultish novelist, Ayn Rand, who wrote Atlas Shrugged. You would think it'd be that cool. No, his wife, or like some little cutesy name that she was like, apparently oh. she is so stupid that she doesn't uh, really believe that Y can sometimes be a vowel. And so it's just like, Rand, Rand. Well, she'll never make it on prices, right? There we go. That's right, man. Okay, let's don't talk about politics. I wasn't. I was talking about some dumbass that can't pronounce his whole fucking name. Or won't pronounce his whole fucking Cause name. Because he's, he's whip. Because his whip is like, well, my wife calls me Rand. I'm Rand. I'm Rand. My name is Poopy. I love there was I'm Bob, Poopy Bobby Slayton did an old joke about that. He goes, he goes, I swear to God, guys will wear anything if a girl says it looks good. He goes, I swear to God, if my wife said, hey, you look great in those clown pants and a, <laughs> a clown wig, he goes, I swear to God, I'd be going everywhere in that fucking outfit. Man. <laughs> I mean, it's true. Bozo. <laughs> Hey, Ryan, look, hey, I owe you 20 from last week. You know, we had a wager. Well, we did. So there's that, and I forgot right. to pay you. So I want the whole world to see Dave no, no, Kendall. Dave's not Welchin. Not Welch. I was glad you used that term. Not Welchin. All right, man. I don't know if Welchin, hey, yeah. Hey, where do we put our little, our little glasses for our, our, our drinks? <laughs> They're in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Great. Oh, man. <laughs> At least it wasn't in your prison purse. That's all I care about. So It's March 20th. We're broadcasting to you live from hey. Scorpion Ranch in Chicobra, the Shangri-La of Central Texas. There we are. Right there, man. Oh, we got a man. I've got a, I'm really psyched about this I, episode. I am, too. I am, too. Uh, Jack to the max. Oh, oh Jack. hey, what I, what I do want to say, if you're watching this on YouTube, go hit subscribe. 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 The reason... You are you are getting very sleepy. Yeah. Keep, Your keep eyes on, are falling. Yeah, you will sleep. hit the subscribe button in three, yeah, like, two, like one. Nine I have a hey. I've, and, and I would love for anybody to subscribe. Love it. Well, Brian, this is a perfect segue. I want double into, digits. Into um, I, I tried to get us a spot. My marketing oh, efforts this week. Yes, we're just I, a oh, failure on all levels. I heard you. You said you wanted to talk about that. Please. Yeah, I tried to yeah. get us a sponsor. <laughs> No, thanks for nothing, Travis Heights Liquor World. <laughs> what, did they sober up and decide that it wasn't a good idea? Or I what? mean, I'm a regular there. Yeah, you know, yeah. My buddy Eric, and I love those guys. I went in, and they had one T-shirt. It's, they got a cool logo. Yeah. And the owner, um, is his name Rohit? I think his name's Rohit. And he, um, 
you know, they're the they're, they're the sons of the original whip in guy. You know, that, oh yeah, those a, guys. That's, oh yeah, that's yeah. That's a piece of Austin lore. Yeah. But, so anywho. And he's got, there's one T-shirt up there with a nice logo. And he's like, yeah, it's a nice, I was admiring it. And mm-hmm. he said, that's a nice T-shirt, isn't it? I said, like, yeah. I said, you know what? If you give that to me, I'll mention you on my podcast. And he said, well, what's your podcast? And I said, Rack on Teresa. And he's like, what the fuck is that supposed to mean? <laughs> that's fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it means we didn't hire a marketing firm, Jack. That's what it means. It means we want you to remember it. You yeah. might not be able to pronounce it, and but you remember something. And to spell it and all that crap. And so anyway, and even though he works with a French guy. Um, and so anyway, and he started, and I'm like, yeah, you know, just not a T-shirt. I said something for all, just a bottle maybe, just a bottle, a six-pack, something. You know, we'll mention you as a sponsor. He's like, and he started with all these questions, you what? know. Yeah, like, um, how many subscribers do you have? Oh, really? And I'm like, hey, you know, we're about to cross see. that crucial double-digit mark. <laughs> Let me start counting them off for you. One, <laughs> two. And then he says, well, why should I get on board with that? And I said, if Grand you don't want to buy Apple stock at a dollar, if you didn't want to buy Netflix at 50 cents, if you don't want to get on the ground board of two middle-aged white guys <laughs> talking about shit that they don't know anything about, then you stand you keep your hands in your pocket, mister. We don't need your money. We don't need your money. We don't need your charity. We don't need none of it. We got this. Unless unless you want to, you know, sponsor us. And oddly oh. enough, oddly enough, you actually did mention them. <laughs> <laughs> Sucking up to the last bitter end. <laughs> He's sitting there at home going, and I didn't have to give away a fucking t-shirt. <laughs> I'm now reminded of that great little Bill Hicks song. Sucking Satan's pecker. <laughs> Stick that scaly god broad down your throat. That's what I love. Hicks, Hicks would never stop. <laughs> he'd go and go. And just when you think, oh, my God, and he'd go a little bit more. <laughs> we'll have to do, we got to do a thing on Bill Hicks someday. Oh, we do. Or not, oh, son of a bitch. That's Bill Hicks. Kick, Bill Hicks kicked that over. Yeah, he got pissed off at you. No, he loves me. No, we should do one on Hicks because that guy, if anybody doesn't know who Bill Hicks is, uh, you got to yeah. talk about somebody who went well before their time. Oh, my God. I mean, he, he was way ahead of his time, you know. Oh, he yeah. was like, I mean, because I trace, here's what, we're going to get off into I, I trace a line from, like, I'm saying, like, Henry Miller to, like, Lenny Bruce mm-hmm. to, you know, all the, the kind of the, he, he, what's his name, you know, the, the, the William Burroughs and all, you know, all these, oh, yeah. these beat kind of guys, guys. And, that were sort of edgy. Yeah. You know, and just to him, because he was yeah. just. God, that guy was pushing some. No, I would. No, we we need to do one on him because I've got some great stories from seeing him a few right, times. Let's do it. Yeah, but you know what we want? Yeah. We're going to do today. I've been I'm psyched about this. My th- there have been so many songs running through my head mm-hmm. as I as I've been doing this one here. We're doing sure. top ten albums on a deserted island. Albums on a deserted time. island. Uh, we, yeah, uh, with we, a funk band playing in the background. We decided that we're just going to beat the shit out of this top ten. <laughs> we're going to run with it. So we'll do the top ten reasons why we shouldn't do another top ten show. <laughs> God, <laughs> get meta. We're gonna do it. It'll be like Inception. <laughs> damn, what stage of sleep are you in? Ah, uh, six point. God damn it. A friend of mine goes, "You should do top ten stripper songs." And I go, Ooh, well, "That's I, a great well, idea." Well, I think just between Motley Crue and Bon Jovi, don't you have them all covered? No. <laughs> but I tell you, I told him, I said, "But if we do it, we want to have strippers on this show." And he said. You, retired he, he said male strippers, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, go, yeah. I go, yeah, that would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, fuck yeah, I want to do that. Yeah. Or like, or like, my name was Cinnamon back in 58. <laughs> and spoken through a hole in her throat. <laughs> I used to remember whenever I did lap dances for John F. Kennedy. <laughs> Man, you're going to try to make me make a joke about a hole in the throat as a sexual orifice. Piece of shit. I'm not going to try. You just cut did that it. Out. You just did cut it. Cut it out. <laughs> now, now, cut that out. 
All of a sudden, you're Paul Lynn and Ami. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, really? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, the funniest guy on Hollywood Squares. Oh, you know, when I was a kid, I thought that guy was brilliant. And I can't tell you how devastated I was when I found out later on that, oh, he got the, you know, the, the before. He wrote, he wrote the joke beforehand. He knew the, the questions. And I was like, Man, what? No. Why did you have to tell me that? Well, I thought you fucking knew I didn't it. know. Well, you do now. Sorry. Oh, you know? You know you can stick your uh, pecker in a hole in a throat. Did you know that, too? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you can stick your pecker <laughs> through a hole in the throat of the guy that wrote the movie Human Centipede, okay? Oh, I, and get I, AIDS. I refuse to see that movie. Just, I'm just like, it's just like, ugh. <laughs> I, I've never seen it. Action. I've never seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 this is a, a, a legitimate German hostel, and you are welcome to stay here for a few measly little modifications to your mouth and your anus. So if you hear that, you might want to go to a different hostel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, just the whole idea of staying in a German hostel scares the fuck out. I don't know why. I know yeah. that they got the best ones. They do? Well, I'm sure. They probably invented that shit. <laughs> Brian, let's get on to today's Except topic. Except they called them, they spelled them H-O-S-T-I-L-E. <laughs> Man, see, I avoided that one. I was like, that's so stupid to say. <laughs> I'm right down. I'm right. I'm just, I'm just going down dumbass lane. Do -do -do -do. <laughs> Welcome to Dumbass Texas. Population Brian. Come here, pull my finger. Do -do -do. <laughs> Look, after the show, we're going to take everybody snipe hunting, so... <laughs> Brian, where's that left-handed smoke shifter? Where is he? Where is he? <laughs> oh, Everything boy. stupid I knew growing up. All right, all right. We're going to do our top ten deserted island uh, list, and we don't like album, 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 albums. And we, 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 you shot one, I shot one. So we, we, this time we have to do a technical way of seeing who's going to go first. All right. Oh, okay. You ready? Rock, paper, scissors. Oh, okay, fine. Okay, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Ready. One, two, two three. three. Son of a bitch. Oh, yeah. Oh, you get closer. Oh, yeah. I forgot what the rock was. Yeah. <laughs> I was going rock. And who's on dumbass lane now? <laughs> you know what? Maybe, I, maybe I'm one step ahead. Maybe I did that for a reason. Oh, well. Maybe, okay. I'm, maybe, maybe I'm playing you like a cheap violin. <laughs> Maybe. That would be novel. Yeah. N-O-V-I-L-E. <laughs> that would be novella. That would really be novella, I told you. All right. Well, speaking of novellas. I've got novellas written on all this stuff. Don't look and don't cheat. No yeah, cheating. By the way, we don't know what each other's top tens are. I, I went straight from the heart. That's what I did. I, stead, I, I, I selected by saying, what, man, something that meant a lot to me. You know, and a lot of it, like what went, meant a lot to me at a certain period of my life. And, um, you know, and then, of course, I started thinking about vinyl. Because oh, yeah. most of these, like half of them I had on vinyl. And you know what? I would all, I, all of these that are on vinyl I had, I had to buy second copies because I wore them out. So. Oh, wow. So that was okay, part you of what went, drove mm, my, you know, you, I'm, you, I'm, pretty, I'm instinctual. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the instinctual, I'm like the id to his super ego. Yeah. Because uh, where you went from the heart, yeah, I went from the liver, is what I went from. Uh, I you, went. You still got one? Yeah. Well, it barely works. But I went for the things that that I thought. I told you, like what I drank the most liquor to. No, that's a and, good. Uh, that's but a, no, but I'll tell you, I went for things that were, at the end of the day, when I started thinking about it, were more of a, a more of a romantic period, yeah. in my head when I heard it. And I got to tell you, when I look back at all these. Almost all these are from when I was like around from 20, from around 20 years old to around almost 30 years old. It was like, that is like really weird. I started thinking about like, you know, I, there was albums I listened to earlier on that were cool, but ones that I just said, Desert Island, it was all these ones that hit when I got, for me personally, it's when I got out of, uh, I got out of, uh, got into punk rock music. When I started getting into punk rock, yeah. that's when things really, I listened to albums before, enjoyed them. When I got into punk rock, shit really hit me hard. Like it really made an impact. And I, I thought about this also. I thought about the ones that the first time that I put the needle down 
on that record that I heard it, I was like, <gasps> I mean, just like two, three notes in, it was like, oh, shit. No this slow is, bills for you. Oh, man. No, it's just like, boom, boom. Oh, we're going to get a primer in uh, Brianville. Oh, we are. Population we are. one. <laughs> Population Why? <laughs> well, are you ready to get started? I am. On oh, my number 10. Oh, shoot. Oh, here we go. Here we go. I had to throw up. I, I called an audible. On I know. That's out. what I heard. I heard. That's what on the streets. You're driving over here. <laughs> big deal. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty big on the streets. Oh, by the way, so a sound effect, um, whenever I do that, what do you want to do? Uh, kaboom. A kaboom. Okay. Right. And do you want a fictional name this week? Oh, yeah. What should my fictional name be? It came up organically as Cordell last week. Yeah, let's just see what comes out organically. All right. But, let's see. Okay, so this is the last time I'm going to call you Brian today. Brian, okay? There we go. All right. Yeah, all right. It'll work. All right. Okay. Are we oh. ready for my number 10? Nope. nope no, nope. let me get a beer. Nope. Well, well, get can we beer. do one little? Oh, we do a shot little, little. I yeah, think I we should do one little. One little. Yeah, one little. <laughs> You're already slurring. So I sure. How about a shot? I know. I'm already well, Maybe we we'll get down that before we get yeah, down know, down the top ten out, boo. Yeah. Well, you know. It's like this is why we have to we can only do this every two weeks. <laughs> Somebody says, Hey, hey, by the way, you wanna come over next week though and let's do some promos? What? Come over next week and let's do some promos. Yeah, yeah. All right, everybody, get ready. Promos Promo. are coming. It's promo bill. All right. Top okay. ten. Top ten. I'll God, that. that is tasty. That's mighty fine. That is tasty. That's the one I threw away. All right, oh, here man. We go. All right. My number 10. Yeah. The album is The Indestructible the indestructible Beat of Soweto. Oh, we talked about that we after well, after the show last week. We were talking about it because I have that too. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Here's my little blurb. <clears throat> this joyful, vibrant collection of songs from the townships of South Africa is a testament to the amazing power of music to arise from the unlikeliest of places. Yeah, I mean... It sounds like Lisa Simpson wrote that. I know. <laughs> it's only except off NPR. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> Did you say it in a real quiet voice? Uh, the indestructible <laughs> sounds of... Uh, this joyful, vibrant collection of songs from the townships of South Africa is a testament to the amazing powers of music. To arise from the unlikeliest of places. And that is so fucking pretty. You know you love the sweaty balls too, right? What? Sweaty balls. Sweaty. You don't prefer to it like. Hey, do you know what Soweto's <laughs> you know what the Soweto is? This the, you know, do you know about what a Soweto stands for? No, I don't know. Soweto. Indestructible beat of Soweto. S O W E T O. Soweto stands for Southwestern Townships. Oh really? And what it was was a way for the the ruling white minority government to yeah. segregate people. They segregated that the happened black in people. Africa, Johannesburg. <laughs> is where yeah. they started. Yeah, and they would segregate the black population in these shanty towns. So they called them Sowetos. They were called southwestern townships oh. because they they just basically made like a, a place y'all can live here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> here's your Palestine. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can yeah. live there, and. Um, and so they shortened the name to Soweto, eventually just called Soweto's. But these, all of these bands, there's like 10. Yeah. Uh, like there's 10 or songs on this. And, um, and they're really, really great. And they're all, <clears throat> they're all, <clears throat> you know, it's from, the, from that area because they, it's going to sound weird. They sound, they, they have the same sort of instruments in there, but they're all very, very different songs. Yeah, and, and 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 here's the thing: if you listen to that, um, you know, I, I hear like st strains of it of uh, like zydeco in there. Oh yeah, I hear like strains of like just, you know, there, there's, but with that harmonies, they've got those vocal harmonies, but it's very, it's weirdly very primitive sounding music with like just these amazing sort of heavenly kind of. Harmonies mixed in there. Oh yeah, and there's like a song where there's a you know like it starts and a rooster's crowing. Oh yeah, oh, oh, oh. oh yeah. I love that record. I think uh, it's one of the greatest things. I, and it's volume one. It's volume one. I, is there? No, I mean, because I bought it because to be honest with you, here's why I bought it: the cover. <laughs> I, I bought. I, yeah, by it's the way, got the By the way, I've, I've lost a small fortune buying albums on covers. <laughs> or, well, or you hear one song. 
but I've also found great things because I bought it literally on that cover, and I was like, well, that's it's not... Those guys. It's a oh, really yeah, cool just cover. like kind of out there like this. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I was like, that looks cool, and I am, I'm so glad you got that one. I love that album. I think it, anybody out there, if you do not have that album, that is one that you could play for even... Because I have friends that aren't really big music people, but you put that on, they're all like, man, what is that? And they start asking, what was that? What is that? Because it's so awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a real... You'll learn a lot by listening to that. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll just get a whole... Well, yeah. Dave, you just started this off with a bang. Man, I am glad. <laughs> My I am God. Happy. Well, now it's time for uh, Brian's number 10. Let's hear oh, it, Oh, you just call me Brian, but... Uh, oh, shit. So... Uh, okay, wait. It's time for... Uh, Clevo. Clevo. I love that. You like it? I love okay. that. Clevo. Clevo. Clevo number no. Clevo, Clevo O'Neill. Brian Clevo O'Neill. out. Clevo in. Clevo O'Neill. Clevo O'Neill. <laughs> Clevo O'Neill. Yeah. Because people Cle- going Clevo Neil or Clevo O'Neill, and I just go Clevo O'Neill. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Clevo O'Neill. Yeah, there we go. Short for Cleveland O'Neill on your ass and pray. <laughs> Glad I shortened it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Boy, imagine sitting standing in line at the DMV with that one. Look, you're not going to like this lady from Cleveland, but. This isn't a come on, but here's what my name is. <laughs> so I here's, remember that. So here's Cleveland. Let's write a song later called Cleveland Clevo. O'Neal yeah. on your. And he's in prayer. Don't on your ass in prayer or something. <laughs> okay, so, Clevo. Here's Clevo. Number, number 10. Number 10. Fugazi. Repeater plus three. Once again, my friend Kelly Keys Handran, owner of Direct Hit Records, and a huge influence on me, my musical exposure, turned me on to these guys. Out of D.C., doing it DIY on their own Discord label, they showed you what a tight rhythm section is the key component to letting two guitars sonically roam all over the landscape and scream out, scream out lyrics of true intentions, plus the fact that every show was five bucks and they never sold out as truly stuff of American legends. Wow. Nice work. Yeah. Yeah, I was blown away by those guys. And my friend Kelly, she ran Direct Hit Records, and I think I've said this before, that I walked into Dallas, came to Dallas, walked in that store. It's like all these punkers in there. Kelly's running it. She's got, like, purple hair and, a, you, know, you know, piercing in her lip. And I just come in this dorky guy, and she was cool as shit and turned me on to all sorts of great music, but got me into Fugazi. And man, and and she brought him to Dallas one time, and we saw him uh, five bucks in a place. And it was funny because Ian was up there. I don't know if you ever seen Fugazi. You ever seen Fugazi? Um, no. Okay. Well, you know they're playing this just rock and music, and it's real political and all this. And the people are screaming and jumping up and down. But but Ian will stop people if they're getting too rough. And he was they're playing, and we're in this place. I was with uh, Donna and our daughter Alex. And we're back along the side, and somebody threw a shoe up there on stage. And Ian was like, who threw that shoe? Who threw that shoe? And then people point him out. The next thing you know, I see Ian dive into the crowd. And we're going, where did he go? Where did he go? He comes running by us with some guy armed behind him, like grabs him, throws him, kicks him out, throws his shoe at him, and then pulls out five bucks. Here's your money back. And throws five bucks at him and shuts the door. Goes back on the stage, just starts rocking out. But every show was $5. And Kelly said after that show, they wound up making around $30,000. And she said she counts it out, gives it to him, and Ian gets it. And he just gets it, takes it, puts it into a backpack, and just puts it in there. She goes, Ian, that's like a lot of money. You should be, you know, probably, you know, doing something like going and, and, and putting, putting it somewhere. He goes, Kelly, it's just money. Come on. You know, because those guys, their Discord label, they were offered back during the heyday in the 90s of all these bands, they were offered like a million dollars to buy it by Warner Brothers or something. They're like, are you, hell no, we're not doing that. This is our own deal, you know. So Fugazi is just amazing to me. I, uh, I, I'm sadly deficient on Fugazi, except knowing the name, you're yeah. going to hate me. I couldn't, I don't know that I've ever heard of Fugazi. Fugazi song. Is that disgusting? You should, no, hell no. That's why we do these things. No, because I know there's I should, all this other shit disgust me about you, but like not that, that. That like I I know that I, who are man. There's another band I think of like that. Like these two brothers that 
Pavement or somebody like that. Oh, pavement. I mean, it's just yeah. Like I see that's a band I know nothing about that I feel like I need to know something because I keep uh, Fugazi and all. Pa- they're well, pa- not nothing alike. No, I'm they're not. Like, but that. pavement is a blast too because Fugazi repeater plus three. The repeater plus, but any Fugazi record, period. Any Fugazi record. They're just amazing. They're because they're just politically. Uh, they're they're very politically aware. Um, and if you see, go on YouTube and watch some of the performances. Guy, uh, Guy Picado and Ian, uh, they are just like, they would play like all over places in, um, in D.C. And they, they play, a trio? Uh, a, a, a four group. Four, a quattro. Quattro. Uh, there's this one thing where they played in some gymnasium, and Guy winds up jumping up there. On, there's a, he's underneath. They're playing underneath like a, a basketball hoop. He jumps um, up underneath there, puts his legs up underneath it, and winds up singing, hanging upside down through this basketball hoop. What's the guy? You know, what are the names of the band members? Uh, it's uh, Ian McKay, uh, Guy or Guy. I don't know what he goes by. Guy Picado, uh, and the drummer and the bass player. It's like Brandon. I can't remember their names yeah, offhand, all. but they're they're. I just want to see if you really were a fan. That's all. Oh no, I'm half a fan, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just half a fan. <laughs> Oh, thanks, <laughs> thanks for emasculating nice. me in front of everybody. Uh, uh, all nine uh, people. Uh, <laughs> how will you ever survive the shame? <laughs> wow. There's nine people in the world that hurt. <laughs> they just go, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Ah, I love that. You know what I'm wanting? I'm wanting. I'm wanting the dude from uh, from uh, Travis Heights Liquor to become a subscriber. That's a goal of mine now. I just want to be. Okay. I don't want him to be a goddamn sponsor anymore. I just want him to fucking subscribe. And with I mean, that, with that spent, attitude, with that attitude, I'm sure he's going to jump right on. It. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've spent some money there. Oh I'm yeah. Not one of the high rollers. Oh, I know because. But I'm a crowd favorite. You you brought you brought that uh that uh Chinese uh oh, that Japanese oh, uh, Chinese whiskey. Yeah, oh, oh, well, yeah. Right. Chinese sorry, whiskey. Sorry, what was it sorry. made from? Uh some yeah. sewage yeah, yeah. Yeah. water. No, the Japanese of... whiskey was one of the best whiskey Nika. I've ever had. Oh, that was some good. I still got the bottle. I saved the bottle. Man, that was oh, that special. Oh. But go ahead. Special. You uh number nine. Clevo asking you. Clevo Nee want to know. Number nine. Number nine, the amazing California Health and Happiness Roadshow by the Mermen. Okay, I've heard of the Mermen, but I've never heard that album. This isn't just a great surf record. This isn't just a great rock record. This isn't just a great instrumental record. This is a freaking masterpiece, a great work of musical art. It rivals Mozart. It rivals Beethoven. Why are you putting it right there? It just goes, well, I got to put it somewhere. Where? You want it to shove it up your ass? What do you Oh, oh, shit. Kaboom! <laughs> oh, not bad. Wait, where's the other one? Oh, shit. So I got about. Kaboom! <laughs> Sorry. Or, Jeez, Brian. or shoved up my ass. Whatever. Up. Whatever. Boy, did I get. Boy, that triggered me. Yeah. Is it? it? PTSD. But, uh, you just saw it. You saw it. You saw it. Hey, man. I'm just Merman. Trying. I've heard of the Merman. But I don't know that. I've got to go get that one now. I love surf music. That's awesome. This is beyond. No, this trans. This is a transcendental record. It's transcendental. It's called what again? In, the in, Amazing California Health and Happiness Roadshow. Oh my God. Um. And the reason I put it on there, it wasn't on my top ten list until I drive it out. Is that here. Audible? Yeah, that's the Audible. Oh, that's the Audible. nice Audible. And um, like I had like heavy-duty psychedelic mushroom experiences yeah. this year, last year, yeah. in the fall. Yeah. And on one of them, like after, oh, the best one. This yeah. was the really good one where I, like, stood at the foot of God or something. Yeah. And, like, after I was, like, back, uh, like, back, you know, like, just coming out of it, I put that record on, and I laid back down. And I saw the fucking world that guy was trying to create. Oh, and it's man. a world. I mean, it's a it's a cycle, and it's all based around the ocean, and this ideal, idyllic, psychedelicized, surreal version of California beach life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I mean, it, it's it's really something. I think it took the guy like five years to make the record. Oh, really? Yeah. Is it one guy? Well, it's it, kind of. No, there's other members, but anytime you go. Look for them. Yeah, it's, they all. There's that one guy. 
But then there's a there's other band members. Yeah, but I the, get like the studios in his house. And I get you. He's yeah. But, I mean, okay. This is a, a an album. I mean, this is like um. This is the dark side of the moon of surf mm. music. I mean, it's a it's a piece. Wow. It is a conceptual. Is it all instrumental? Yes. Okay, okay. No, you would love it. Wow. You would fucking love it. I love that. The second song is called White Trash Raga. Oh, man. And it's man. like a... I mean, I'm not kidding you, man. I just... I'm, I'm a surf... No. I'm a surf freak between, you know, mummies and, you know... Dick uh, Dale. Dick... I've seen Dick... You know, Dick Dale. Have you ever seen that guy? <laughs> yeah. No, no he, plays on, he plays on strings that are like piano <laughs> strings. <laughs> yeah. His guitar has piano strings on yeah, it. So, I mean, like it's like... Strings. And apparently back in the day... Uh, Fender would use him to test out various yeah, that's right. uh, amps and pedals and guitars and all that Leo, stuff. Leo, Leo and Dick Dale. Were yeah. Were buddies. yeah, 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 yeah. For sure. The Merman. Yeah, I the love Merman. that. I love that's a that. Classic. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying it's a classic piece of musical art. Oh, man. Yeah, piece of art. Work. Okay, okay, because right. I'm like big Phantom Surfers, Mummies, all that, so I love that. Yeah. That's awesome. You should you listen to it. So now we're on to your number nine. Number nine. Cleve O'Neill's number nine. Cleve O'Neill. Cleve O'Neill. Raining sound, too much guitar. This is music from a sorely underrated singer, Greg Cartwright. He started in the Bolivians and started the white punk blues, then perfected the songs in the raining sound. The album screams with rhythmic guitars from the first note to the last, all turned up to 10 on the amps and 10 on the scale of this fucking rocks. Yeah. If you don't know... The raining sound, you are missing out. How do you spell that? R e i g n i n g. Sound. Sounds. Yeah, raining sound. Never heard. Of and uh, he came from the Oblivions, which were like sort of the precursor of this punk, this punk blues stuff, white punk blues. And uh, he now has this raining sound, and they are just. He writes these fantastic songs, and they're in these kind of like sort of these kind of punk sort of ways but he but he interprets it goes back and finds a lot of old songs and covers them and he's a real I you know historian of music uh, but what he writes are just amazing lyrics and he is sorely sorely underrated you know ask Walter Daniels Walter if you're watching this you will know what I'm talking about you'll you'll back me on this uh, they are just incredible did I, and I tell you that when they played the last time I saw them, they played here at uh, at uh, Barracuda, which is closed now, unfortunately. Thank you, fucking COVID. And um, so closed now. Because COVID really cared. Cared, yeah, about rock and roll. But uh, but it was funny. I was saw them, and I was I usually don't get in like any sort of little pit, you know, like I kind of stay away from that. But everybody was having so much fun. I go, screw it. I'm going to get in the middle of the crowd. So I'm in the middle of the crowd. They're playing songs. It's great. And Greg stops. He goes, all right, I need somebody to come up here and, you know, and to uh, actually, you know, play tambourine on this song. And he looks at the crowd. He looks at me. He goes, you come up here. And I'm sitting there to myself thinking, well, you don't want me up there. And there was this really good looking girl to my left. I go, you want her. So I'm looking and going, her, I go, I go, you go up. You go, you should go up. You should go up. And she sits there and she just stares at me, doesn't say shit. And I'm enough of a performer to know, you don't want to fucking slow this down. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So I jumped up there, played tambourine on the song. It was awesome. It was great. I left the stage, get up the stage. Some girl runs up and hugs me. And I'm sitting there going, that's why people get into bands. If I play tambourine and got that kind of hug, holy shit, what if these lead singers <laughs> Yeah, what if you break out a mini mood? <laughs> but I got to tell you. Too much guitar is exactly exactly what it is on the on the name of the of the of the uh, of the record. You get it in, and off the bat, it is just like guitars are just like wah, just going off the bat, just kicking ass, man. Let me know when you want one of these. I will. I will. So just kicking ass. Well, so so it's, 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 it's a good one. Is that, so what kind of music is it? Is your Michael rock and roll? Total rock and roll. R and R. Total rock and Where's roll. Where's it got? What era is it from? Where's uh, it? It's 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 right now. They just put a new album out the other day. Uh, Where are they from? Uh, originally he was from Memphis, but I think now he lives out in South Carolina, North Carolina somewhere, I think. Um, I think it's where he lives, but he started this band called the Oblivions, which you ought to check them out. They are the one of the craziest, coolest, 
punk blues band you'll ever have the opportunity to hear. I mean, I've actually had a joke like, I, you know, like uh, at times in my mind, you know, yeah. I just think to myself, um, I'm thankfully I'm easily entertained by my own thoughts. <laughs> but I have like at one, more than one point said, I am from the planet Oblivion. You really? Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, please. Oblivion get... is one of my, I'll tell you, here's a little secret. Oblivion is one of my favorite words. Oh, yeah. man. So when you said Oblivions, I'm like, well, you this gotta... is my s- s- brother from another mother. Thank you. That you think you're lucky, stars. Oh, I you're know. from another mother. Yeah, I know, man. I know. Yeah. Well, you're the lucky one. I know. Bastard. I know. I feel good. <laughs> you're okay. comp- you got the most fucked up compliments, man. I know. <laughs> hey, do you? hey, you know, I did I do want to tell you something though. Those glasses are really stylish. <laughs> I call them the less Nesmans. <laughs> Just less. <laughs> wow. That many you people, know what? How I many know, people get that? I got the reference. <laughs> the humanity. <laughs> the humanity. One of the greatest episodes ever. Ever. Of anything. Of anything. Of anything. Because, I mean, the humanity. That's what the guy was saying. <laughs> what do you say? They're dropping like. What do you. <laughs> they're dropping like. No, the turkeys can't fly. <laughs> you don't know who gets up there. For the love. As God is my witness. I thought turkeys could fly. <laughs> yeah, but you know the, where that comes from, the humanity. No. It, no, it's the act that there was a live broadcast of the Hindenburg when oh. it went up in flames, oh, and really? the announcer said, the humanity. Oh, really? Yeah, they were referencing the Hindenburg <laughs> tragedy. That's how fucking clever that show was. Oh, my God. What we're talking about here, if y'all don't know. WKRP in Cincinnati. Sorry, I ruined that for you. That's perfect. That's perfect. And it's their Thanksgiving episode. Look at the turkeys dropping episode. That is truly one of the greatest things ever. (laughs) And and, and you want to know the uh, reality of that one? A reality? I saw this, and somebody sent me this the other day, and this was back in the, probably in the 60s, and it was a le- legitimate news thing where this, and it was up in Washington or Oregon, I think maybe Oregon, and where a uh, a uh, whale uh, beached up on the on the on the beach, right? With, you know, on the beach is up there, and they go, "How do we get rid of it?" These guys go, "Well, what we'll do is we'll blow it up, and we'll set these explosives to blow up." Where to blow it out towards the ocean. And they go, okay, that's a great idea. So the, the film crew and people came out to watch this thing explode. Was well, so, like the, that guy from Alabama that goes, like, this is a great idea. It sounds like the most redneck. Yeah, 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 exactly. The Hold My Beer. It's like we're one step away from Hold My Beer. So, and this is a, a watch it, go to YouTube. It's something about watch, look up whale blowing up Oregon. I think it's Oregon. And, uh, and so these guys, this demolition crew came out and put all this, um, all this, uh, you know, explosives around it to blow it out to the ocean. What they didn't take into account is that it was on sand, right? Not rock. So the film crew's there. Everybody's hanging on the on the edge of this like little bluff, looking over at it, and they blow this thing up. When they do, because it's sand, it blows down into the sand and blows it back up this way to everybody. <laughs> and you have see the film crews going, and the guy starts going, oh, my Lord, it's coming out. It's just coming out. <laughs> and you, you see chunks of whale <laughs> coming in and splattering. <laughs> and the film crew comes around, and people are running, and chunks of whale are in around. Chunks of whale. <laughs> Wait, I've been writing down things as we're going along. I wrote down uh, what the what the something something. But anyway, I'm gonna, and I put Cleve O'Neill. Cleve O'Neill. And now I got to write chunks <laughs> chunks o whale. Yeah. God, I wish I could think of what WTTS meant. Can, does that bring a bell? <laughs> no, you're like me. I write something down like. What's that supposed to mean? I was trying not to look rude on camera by like writing while you were talking. W T T S. But I wrote W T T S. It was so important. No, no, no. But but that one's worth looking up. But but definitely look up. Oh shit! I you, you remember up here? No. Okay. Sorry. Hey, by the way, uh, on your Audible, what did you what did you knock out of the uh, your top ten on the Audible? Who's next by the Who? Ah, all right. And I wrote. You know, I, I wrote, it's just, it's this classic rock staple is about as perfect. It's, yeah. I mean, I like every song on that record. Yeah, yeah. You know, won't Get Fooled Again. Oh, yeah. You know, Bob oh. O'Reilly. Oh, 
uh, I watched the Waco Brothers the other night, and they didn't do Baba. They were almost going to do it. They didn't do it. But by the way, we watched a thing on the uh, uh, other night on uh, we saw uh, the Who, and it was a it was a their first video in 1964, and they were doing a blues song. W- look it up. It was amazing, amazing. Well, they did summertime blues. Yeah, they that's did. Cool. Uh, you know, they the, they did fortune teller. I love which that is song. a really interesting song written by. Uh, Who does that? Uh, it's, yeah, it's, an, it's. I think it's Alan Toussaint. Was it really? Yeah, I think it was. Wow, because everybody's covered that, yeah. you know. And what's the other one about? He did. They did a song by Mo, Oh uh, Young Man's Blues. Mose Allison. They were interesting. I love Mose. But I don't. Li- you know, like I, I, you know, Tommy and, you know, the Pinball Wizard, all that stuff. Man, I just you know, it's a little bit. Pete's a little bit sort of. Well, he can be just a tad uh, bit pretentious. Really? Really? <laughs> and a tad bit trying to run from the cops. So, okay. Uh, uh, but no. no, no. Number eight. Number ready? eight. This is going to come out of left field for you. Really? The album, Go So, Poderoso. The artist is Atercio Pelados, which means the velvety ones. That's my favorite artist. He's a lying, <laughs> lying motherfucker. <laughs> Never heard of him. WTTS. Yeah, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> Welcome to the shithole. <laughs> you need an H in there somewhere. No, WTT. Oh, you're right, you're right, right. Welcome to the... Well, that doesn't say much about our podcast, does it? It says everything about our podcast. Oh, that's even worse. It is that's right. even worse. It is true. Okay, here we go. Okay. The first song on this remarkable album. Oh, oh like, tell me the, tell me. Oh, what? T- tell me the whole thing before the. Go so poderoso. Atercio pelados. The first song on this remarkable album by the Colombian duo is a real gem. It sounds like lying on a jungle beach at night with a perfect buzz, and the rest of them are racing across the waves neck and neck. Oh man. Kaboom! Kaboom! Wow! I never. Okay, you need to send these to me so I can put them on to the to uh, uh, the YouTube channel. Will do. So, the YouTube. <laughs> so yeah. We're gonna smoke. Yeah, we're, we're gonna smoke some of the marijuana and then go to the YouTube. Yeah, never. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, so uh, the song, the so, song, that song, the first song on that record, Go So Poderoso, is uh, which means powerful something. Um, is called Luz Azul, which means blue light. Yeah, yeah. And I remember exactly where I was when I heard that song. Yeah. I was on a work, I was back in my construction days. This was only like like maybe 20 years Wait, ago. Wait, you, you didn't hear this when you were living down in Costa Rica or something? No. Oh, really? I heard this on KUT like 20 years ago. Oh, I was my on God. A and this guy played it. Ailey? It wasn't Ailey, it was uh, Michael Crockett. He was, yeah, used to okay. do all the, yeah. He used to do all the Spanish stuff, yeah. Latin stuff. And um, so I had to stop working and go call and say, what the fuck was that? Oh, really? And he's like, oh, my God. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, so then I got the record. And it's real trippy. It's like very sort of cosmic sh- shaman kind of surreal. If you go watch that video of Luz Azul, uh-huh. L-U-Z-A-Z-U-L, yeah. it's just like the song. Oh, really? I mean, it's it's perfect. It's a perfect piece of sort of... I mean, I really can't find a flaw in that song at all. I think it's absolutely I perfect, want, and they're ding, 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 ding. It just sounds like it sounds like being on a beach. Oh uh, man, I got to get that one. You got to hear that. You'd like it. You'd I like would. It. You'd like. It. I would. Yeah, the whole record's pretty good. Oh man, I love this. I'm having the best goddamn time, man. This is like ridiculous. Number eight. Number eight for From me. Cleve O'Neill. Cleve O'Neill, O'Neil. ladies and gentlemen. Cleve O'Neill. I I, uh, I did a uh, I uh, gave you a little telegraph shot to this one earlier. All right. Oh, good. Daniel Johnston, Yip Jump Music. This is a compilation of Daniel's cassettes that I just showed Dave that he handed out at his job at McDonald's, and you feel everything from his tortured soul, that everything that his tortured soul went through, from Casper the Friendly Ghost to Speeding Motorcycle to the beautiful Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Your Grievances. You hear the pain and the joy in Daniel's heart, along with the TV blaring and the phone ringing in his apartment where he recorded these. There's no other like Daniel Johnston. 
that guy, and, and I don't know if you, I, I just showed Dave, I had, I have three of the cassette tapes that Daniel made by hand, and, uh, and my friend Kelly, again, Kelly from Direct Hit, uh, had those, and it was just like, what the heck? I mean, just, apparently he handed them out at McDonald's where he worked. Yeah. You know, so, uh, I mean, you know who Daniel is. Yeah, of course. And so, uh, that, and there's a great documentary on there. If anybody knows who he is, go to this documentary. It's amazing. But, um, yeah, just, I've never heard such heartfelt lyrics in my whole life, you know? And it's sort of like, it's sort of like the, the outsider art that I collect. I collect this crazy outsider art. And I remember my grandmother walked in one time and she looked at it. And she goes, that looks like a three-year-old did that. And she was right. That's the point. <laughs> she, she was right. And I was like, yeah, you know, you got, yeah, that's right. And, uh, but to me, it's like beautiful. So I hear Daniel's singing and all this stuff. I mean, it's real like, you know, speeding motorcycle of your heart. I mean, oh my God. I mean, I just, I just can't imagine that you can write something that freaking beautiful and, and, and be unfortunately that much of a tortured artist, unfortunately, yeah. you know, you know, this reminds me when I first moved here, um, I lived in this house over in Clarksville, but like by by then, like it was like it was four hundred dollars a month rent. It would be four thousand. Oh, today, yeah. But there was this guy that used to come over there. I lived with this guy who was a real he was avant gardish himself, you yeah. know, and and knew these uh, out there musicians. And there was this guy that came over. Uh, it wasn't Daniel Johnston. Yeah. That's not the big reveal. Yeah. But there was a guy that came over. It was about that time when Daniel Johnston was coming out. Yeah, and. Um, he like one night got a guitar and just I didn't know this guy was anybody. Just Stu was his name, mm-hmm. and he sat and just started singing one song after another. And they were this hilarious, like uh, funny and very sad songs that were just a lot like this raw, emotional from the point of view of somebody who's definitely on the margins of society. Yeah, like yeah, he was. Yeah, and uh, like uh, these songs would make you laugh and just then be very sad because you realize he's writing from the sadness of his heart. Yeah, and I remember like one of the songs <laughs> about a woman he obviously was in love with, who probably didn't even know existed. But it's like she, he, the the chorus is like, "She's the horse I couldn't saddle." <laughs> oh my god, that is awesome! Oh my god, that makes me think. I mean, Daniel uh, Johnson wrote from that point of view of just like open, wounded. This oh, is oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean if anybody if you don't know who Daniel Johnson is, you should go get some. You know who turned me on to Daniel Johnson? Who? It was uh, it was not it was a guy from Cleveland. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, that's that's Cleveland fantastic. O'Neal. <laughs> Pray. Cleveland knows what he's talking about. You know, like I say, I got turned on to him by my friend Kelly, their direct hit, because he was having this independent music festival. And she, now I think we did this on another Kelly's podcast. Your she is. She is. I love her to death. And uh, and she kept telling me she goes, we got Daniel Johnson coming. We got Daniel. I was like, and I was trying to be cool, like, oh, that's great. Yeah. And then finally I go, you knew who he was? Okay. No, I didn't. I finally go, okay. I oh, don't that's know. great. I don't know who that is. She goes, oh my god. And that's when she got these tapes out. And so I bought um, at five bucks a piece, bought them, and was like, oh my god, and just like was floored. I mean, <clears throat> something about purity, just to, from a pure standpoint of just love. Something coming out slash tortured is cool. Oh I, yeah, I don't do that. Tortured but. souls. Yeah. Oh, so that's what arts. That's where art springs from, baby. That's what it is, baby. All right, all right. So, are we on number seven? Seven. That's what I have. All right. Let's go. Oh, I can't it. wait to see what you think about this. <clears throat> Rock and Roll Animal by Lou Reed. Oh my God! I heard some of that yesterday on the radio. I know. I know. Plenty of people especially you purist Velvet Underground and Lou Reed fans, hate this record. But if you're a wannabe rock guitarist, this is about as good as it gets. Yeah. yeah. The dynamic duo of... Kaboom! Kaboom! Steve, Hunter, and Dick. Kaboom! Kaboom! <laughs> God damn, get out of here. <laughs> Fuck, is that? It's like a ladybug. Lou will not leave us alone. Yeah, Lou. Yeah, man. You like yeah. that record? Oh, I love you it. You know it? I yeah. love it. No, no, totally. But you know how it is. Like, you know, there's the Velvet Underground sort of fans or Lou Reed. But, I mean, because, you know, it is just, like, radically. He, it, Lou didn't like it. 
Well, but but he didn't like it. What is Lou did? Was it? What was that one? Metal music? What was that one? Metal metal machine. Music. Metal machine music. Yeah, I was like, whatever. Well, he did that to get out of a recording contract. He did. He yeah. did. And they put it out anyway. Yeah. Idiots. But no, I mean, I'm like you. I understand people that are like purists of Velvet Underground, and all that stuff. But I'm not one of those people because I just see the Velvet Underground like what an influence. Yeah. You know. Incredible. You know the old saying like only a thousand people. Listen to Saw the Velvet it. Underground, but every one of them started a band. Started a band, yeah. Right. I told you I get. But look, by the way, so the rock and roll, rock and roll animal live album by Lou Reed, recorded at Max's Kansas City. Oh, um, I didn't know that's where yeah. it recorded. Okay, and it's so this was Lou post Velvet Underground. You know, Velvet Underground had a certain sound uh, that you know is now very famous and very influential. But he went. As Lou was wont to do, Lou just shifted gears. Yeah. He hired like a twin guitar duo of Steve Hunter, Dick Wagner. They were both from Detroit. Mm -hmm. They were both part of this sort of iron city, uh, this uh, motor city kind of, yeah. you know, out of the Iggy. Iggy, Iggy pop, MC5. Um, MC5. Yeah. Uh, all of that, you know, very influential. And um, so he did this, you know, but the treatments of the songs. Sweet Jane, um, Heroin, Lady Day, uh, White Light, White Heat going up my mind, and uh, Rock and Roll. There's only like five rock songs. Rock and Roll is a song that I heard yesterday on the radio. And Janie I told said when she was just five years old, that's nothing happening at all. No, I heard it and I just told Donna. She started dancing to that fine, fine music. Her life was saved by Rock and Roll. Hey, Janie, Rock and Roll. Uh, now I told Donna, I go, I go, how could you not love this song? It's just, it's just organic. So it's a live record. Yeah. Uh, it's got a lot of guitar on it, and I mean, it's, it's it's some of the best guitar work you know that I can think of. The opening, the intro to "Sweet Jane" is this beautiful intro with dual guitars. I mean, it's like you know, it's sort of the Detroit version of the Almond Brothers. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's very <clears throat> hard. It's just very yeah. And then Alice Cooper stole those guys from Lou. Oh, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, he stole Steve and Steve oh, Hunter Dick Wagner. Oh, okay. And, 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 last thing, uh, this is Lou Reed's first gold record. What? Yeah, first record. Well, gold. yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you know, any, most good records never went gold. <laughs> most, a lot of them are never, never made it anywhere. Ah, good choice, my friend. That's the album, like, um, if my friend Mike, if you're, who am I kidding? He never Mike, listened. if you want to subscribe. Be, no, be number it's 10. Too late. Be There's number no use 10. talking to Mike. Be Mike's not there. Sorry. <laughs> but like, so, you know, Mike's one of my... Clevo, Clevo Neal is bummed out. Yeah, I'm sorry, I love Clevo. talking to myself in the third person. Even no, I, that's, not that's, that person. The, that's the... Uh, that is the thing about Clevo Neal. Clevo, Clevo don't care. That's like the Clevo... Yeah, you're like the... Clevo Carl don't Malone. care like Mike don't care. You know, you remember that basketball player Carl Malone played for the Utah yeah, Jazz? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where, like, he said something real outrageous one time, and then somebody, like, some sports said, well, you said that, you're, you know, y'all would beat the Chicago Bulls in five games. He's like, man, Carl Malone was crazy last week. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what he does? He has a trucking company. Yeah, that's I love yeah. that. A, a semi-trucking company, man. It's, yeah, like, just yeah. so good. Carl Malone. Yeah. From Carl Malone to the Velvet Underground. <laughs> Only here will rack on Teresta. Rack on Teresta. Where, where the fuck else Take are you Take that, gonna Travis hear this? Heights. Take that, Travis Heights, huh? Yeah, where else are you going to hear this? Where are you going to hear range? this? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I'm not bragging. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm going to. Is I'm, this your number six? I'm bartering. I'm bartering right now. Oh, are you? You got a belt. I uh, got a electric oh, jellyfish? Yeah, of course you. Of course, my friend. You know, Brian, have I ever told you I love you? I love you too, buddy. I love that, man. That's sweet. I'll, I'll trade you this beer right here. <laughs> <laughs> wow, way to go. I knew, I mean, wow. That's, that's a friend. When you trade, a, I mean, this is this is like limited edition. It is. This is like a 59 less Paul. And that's limited, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is like... <laughs> a, a, this is a two by four with a string on it you found out of a garbage dump. Sorry, pick. I mean, unless y'all want to subscribe, then this is the best fucking best. This is the best thing ever in a way. Best made spicy pickle beer. 
Best yeah, made spicy best. pickled look, beer. Look, I'm going to yeah. show you all this. Yeah, You're show, not going to yeah, believe it. <laughs> For those of you that watch all of them, you know that we had the pickle beer. <laughs> and, then, then, and then I went up finding a spicy pickle beer. So uh, I can't wait to drink that. I think it's a, yeah, you have to you have to take a, a nasty ass little sip of that shit. Well, yeah, we will. You know, for sure we will. We'll have to get a we'll have to have a couple glasses out here. I forgot to bring out glasses. I don't know why they wouldn't. You know, when I ask you, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I, 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 no, because I was they've in, expanded. I was in Dallas the other day, and that's when I sent they've you this expanded. picture of it. And I started laughing. I go, I was I, I sent a picture to Dave. I go, yeah. Pickle beer wasn't enough. Here we go. <laughs> Spicy pickle beer. I was like, Jesus no Christ, That's man. Good. Hey, Cleve. King. Boom. That was different. Oh, <laughs> wow. One step ahead. Yeah. Okay. It's always one step Is it ahead. number seven? Number seven for me? Um, yes. yes. Okay. Number seven for me. Rank and file. Sundown. Cow punk is one of my favorite genres of music, and these guys nailed it at its best. From the barbed wire cover to the twangy guitars to the impeccable harmonies of Chip and Tony Kinman, it was sweet music that sweep across the prairie or sweep into the punk rock club. Any cow punk band that wrote the song Amanda Ruth that so impressed the Everly Brothers that they recorded it deserves a special spot in the world. Yep. Well, that's very good. Yeah. Yeah, rank and file. I love, I love cow punk. From Jason the Scorchers. Wait, is that Alejandro? Alejandro was in that at the that that, that is it first iteration. No, no Lone Justice. I'm thinking Lone Justice. Lone Justice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. No, me. Alejandro was in the first iteration of uh, of Rank and File after the the deals broke up and they came out this direction. But I mean, like you know, between like I said, between those guys and the Beat Farmers and Jason the Scorchers. Oh, Jason and the Scorchers. Yeah, Jason the Scorchers and Guadalcanal Diary and all that stuff. I just love that cow punk. But those guys, what's funny because they were, came from this punk rock band, The Dills. And to turn around and go, we're going to do, let's do country punk. And it was, and they not only did we, they do country punk, they freaking nailed it, man. I mean, it is just one of the coolest albums. Yeah. I mean, these brothers with, you know, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I can't remember who has the higher pitch voice because one of them died the other day. I think Chip died. Tony's still alive. I think that's right, or vice versa. But um, but yeah, I think they're just amazing. Because that's their iterations, everything. They went from the Dills punk rock to rank and file, um, you know, cow punk to uh, to Cowboy Nation, which was cowboy songs. Yeah. And then they went to Blackbird, where they did these 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 like I know it's like. Here we're outside, so you get to hear the planes come by. These, uh, these kind of like uh, electronica songs that they did, uh, versions of their other songs, it was just crazy. I mean, those guys, awesome. those guys are just incredible. Well, I want to know more about them. Yeah, they're 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 fantastic. Extrapolate. Keep going. I gotta mm. go. Dave's got to go take a break here right now. Dave's gonna go uh, be at one with nature out here. Uh, but uh, I tell you that I saw, I never saw rank and file. Okay, I never saw rank and file. That was a big, uh, a big bummer for me. But I did see Cowboy Nation one time when I've lived in LA. Don and I went over to Glendale and they played at a Borders uh, bookstore. And they came out and played this country and western music, just Chip and Tony uh, on guitar and bass, played these cowboy songs. And it was just stunning, just absolutely stunning. And uh, it was just to watch those guys play was just amazing. But I got to tell you, I just have the utmost respect for them, especially for anybody that came through all the whole punk rock world and actually became better. You know what I mean? They didn't just stay punk rock. They didn't stay punk rock at all. And you're you're fucking up my my landscape here, bro. Oh. I want to present to you. Okay, <laughs> <Dead> flowers. <laughs> Ooh, how, 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 how very, how very Rolling Stone of you. <laughs> I think that makes a nice. It does can we see it? I hope we can see it. We can't. We will. We there we will. go. Dead flowers coming at you. All right. Awesome. Rank and file. There was it. God, I got to know more about that. You got to turn me on to that. 
I will. I will. They're awesome. Sorry, I had to leave. Came back. He Don't did. Apologize. But he came back with a with a with a bouquet of apology. I don't, wow, what a man. <laughs> what a guy. I mean, this hey ladies, look, if your man's not treating you right. Come look at me. Yeah. Come respect. look at me. Uh, re S P E C T. There we go. That's what that means to Clevo Neil Neil. You're gonna be so bored with me on the next pick, but that's the way it is. Really? Is this not my number six? Already. Already. All right, here we go. Oh, God, I hate myself. Oh, oh God, I'm sorry, is that Drew? What? No, is that drooling? Was that drooling? Yeah, well, but that's not, that really wasn't unusual, so. Oh, wow, well, okay. That what? really is not that different what? than normal. What? Do you saying? Go. All right, I had to do it. Yeah. Oh, wait, where is it? Oh, here we go. All right, here's my number six. Abbey Road, the Beatles. Yeah, how can you be bored with that? Because there has to be at least, at least one Beatles album on this list. And this is the one I listen to the most, plus it has one of McCartney's greatest vocals on Oh, darling. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean. We just never talk about the, 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 uh, the gods. Of, well, you know. on purpose. On purpose. Yeah, I think. Because there's plenty of uh, podcasts out there that, you know, are going that. We're, we're going Carl Malone, uh, Lou Reed. That's that. <laughs> We're going Carmelo and Rue, the, the Lou Reed tie-in. We'll let everybody else do the do uh, you know do the Beatles. But bottom line is, if anybody's out there, going no Beatles, Be- no Rack and Teresa. Yeah, everybody's going Beatles, whatever. Ozzy Osbourne, when well, they go, who is your great, the ba- greatest band ever? He goes, oh, the Beatles. You know, yeah. I mean, when you hear Ozzy and like what? I mean, I, I, you can't go wrong. I mean. When you think about this, I mean, they're the reason that Vox made the 100-watt amp is because they couldn't be heard with these 40-watt and 50-watt amps, so Vox made the 100-watt amp. And do you know that's what they played at that Shea Stadium gig? Where you couldn't hear You couldn't hear shit. Yeah. So, I mean, so, I mean, these guys were just, you know, and I've heard, and, and I wasn't obviously around when they came out, and, but everybody who was of that age... When they saw them on Ed Sullivan, just yeah. goes, that was it. That it's was just to. a whole different. Like there's a to me, there's a few things you got. You've got, you got the Beatles, you got Elvis, you got the Beatles, you've got punk rock. Jimi Hendrix. Hendrix, yeah, Hendrix. I punk, think, I think, yeah, punk yeah. rock, and then Nirvana. You got these oh, genres yeah. of yeah. these little increments, these little high points of things. But the bottom line is, out of all that, you will never, in my opinion, ever top the Beatles. There's a there's a um, a show on my favorite radio station. W- and what is the radio station? WWOZ. Yeah. Out of New Orleans, the greatest radio station in the nation. There we go. So there's a guy on Wednesday morning, uh, and he always does a thing where he plays uh, like jazz. It's always jazz. Uh huh. And he plays like jazz versions of popular songs. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many, you know how many jazz versions of Beatles songs there are. Oh, oh, sure, it's like crazy. And it's not just because they were popular. Yeah. It's because they're really good songs. Yeah. I mean, oh, darling. Like I've learned, I have a Beatles. Uh, it's called the like the Beatles guitar handbook. Yeah. And it's every Beatles song, and it's just the guitar chords. And they're and they're so basic. Well, yeah, but they're but, 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 like "Oh, Darling" is a like a, a twelve bar blues R and B, but it's got key differences. Yeah, like critical moments in a oh, song. Oh, yeah. I mean, those guys were so intuitive. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There was something about Lennon and McCartney's pod, uh, partnership, I think, akin to the Cleve O'Neill, Dave Kendall partnership. Obviously. It's 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 so apparent. It's like large print newspaper. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry it. we even had to mention it. Yeah, yeah. I'm surely you thought about it before I'm now. Sure. They were sitting at home going, all nine subscribers going, I can't believe that number ten can't come along and. Put as that. soon as so, I said Lennon McCartney, the whole nine people went. <laughs> oh, that's Dave and Cleve. Hey, Cleve wait, and Dave. Hey, wait, no, I should be listening to that instead of this. <laughs> <laughs> See, there you go. There you go, dragging us down again. With your I do. Negative. I do. Self-deprecation. I rule. Yes. Dave and Cleve. Clevo. Clevo don't, Clevo don't care. And I don't even think, you know, Abbey Road is not the best Beatles record 
It's hard to pick a best Beatles record. I mean, I liked it. I mean, I think it's a lot of, uh, you know, it's not them at their most cohesive. Like, yeah, but because they were sort I, of. I personally like Abbey Road a ton. Well, it's uh, got some really good songs. But, on you it. know, just, just, that was back in the day whenever, like, when an album was released, everybody was waiting for it, you know, because there, yeah. there wasn't that much music out there. And so, uh, and so they're waiting to hear all this sort of stuff. So, and you know, that's the one where, like, the, the, you know, like they were tr trying to show that Paul, the rumors that Paul was Wasn't dead because yeah. he was out of sync with them. Like yeah. the, the album is them crossing Abbey Road, that famous. Oh yeah, no, no, I thought he and had Paul's like, barefooted, barefoot, and so, out of step. So they're saying, okay, that meant he was the yeah. corpse in the in right, right. the in the in the in the, uh, in the casket. God, those guys were. I mean, they just. I mean, that they were able to deal... Now, the people are instantaneously dealing with pop culture. It's all just too instant. But, like, they were actually able to deal with the rumor that Paul McCartney had died and they'd replaced him with somebody that looked just like him. Oh, yeah. In real time. Oh, yeah. By, by putting on the cover of an album. Oh, yeah. I mean, there will never be, there will never be anything to equal the Beatles. Will no, we? no, no. I, I agree with you a thousand percent. The, the, the best anything could ever happen is... Almost as good as the Beatles, because there is nobody that you, those two or those four came up with such great music. It was just over the top. Well, you know, uh, like even, you know, it, and really kind of those two, except it wouldn't have been the same without the other No, people. no, they said, they said that whenever Pete Best was in the band and they were, the Pete was over there with them in, in, in uh, Germany when they're all doing speed and playing like literally like six hours a night. Right. Uh, and so when it, they, ca they came back yeah. and, you know, Ringo was, you know, the biggest drummer and he was right. a bigger star in London than yep. they were. Right. And when they finally got rid of Pete and I think, I think Brian, uh, their, uh, their What's that town, what's the German town? Ha uh, uh, Hamburg. They were in Hamburg. Hamburg. Yeah, that's Hamburg. right. Hamburg. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hamburg. And, uh, you know, they stayed, like, at the, in these little, like, little uh, apartments right behind the club. Yeah, I mean, it was, like, really crazy where they, yeah. where they did. And um, when they got back there, I think Epstein, Brian Epstein, is the one that said, let's get Ringo. And Ringo didn't really want to go no, with him. No, he didn't. He was, because he was he already was making. Sassy already. And he was making, yeah, tons of good yeah. jack. And, uh, and they said that. Once they said the first time they played with Ringo, and I think Ringo played with them once and then finally came back. They said the first time he played, they just go, they said McCartney and uh, and Lennon looked at each other and go, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, man, this is amazing. You well, know? yeah, if you hear, there's stuff like you hear about, because they would play, they, so what they had to do is they went to Hamburg. And they played this incredible, um, like they would play like six nights a week for like eight hours. Six, eight and hours. this was a this was the red zone road. Oh yeah, it was all these strip they played and strip these, joints and, they, and all they were this. It was owned by like mobsters. Yeah, yeah. And like these guys would come, these mobsters would come in late at night, fucked up and like yeah. make them play like how high the moon or yeah. something. And they'd have to play all that. And they and and like so if you hear like recordings of them when they came back from there, they were a, and they figured that they got like three years of regular gigging practice in six weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when they came back, they were a tight-assed oh, yeah. R&B outfit. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's it's just like, yeah. those are the kind of things that the casual listener doesn't really realize, no. that they were a tight-ass band. And over there, what they call the Silver Beatles at that point? Well, that was, yeah. No, I think the, I can, but... Not but like yeah. my band, the Dung Beatles. <laughs> That'd be... That'd be one of our bands. All right. So. Wait, though. I, I got to tell you one story. Can yes. I tell you one quick yes, story? Yes, 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 yes. Please. This is, I'll make it quick about no, the no, Beatles. No. So I was in this, uh, my, the job I have is, requires me to be in people's houses um, against their will. It's, I'm a cat burglar. Um, <laughs> no, I go to. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm part of the Cat Burgers Union. Cat Burgers and Association, so, CBA. If, I, if CBA. I'm not in there, I ain't getting my dues paid. So. <laughs> so I went to this woman's house one time, like up, uh, uh, right around Pease Park, upscale. Yeah. You know? And like, I mean, super just antique, fine, beautiful stuff, you know. And she was very, you know, proper and all this and talking to me and um, had like an entire room that was like the interior of the room was imported from a Scottish, uh, like, factory or something. It was like this, the 
Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, the whole thing's incredible. And then, like, she was showing me around, and we got up to the top of her stairs, and there's a giant black and white photo of the Beatles with Pete Best. Really? And I stopped, and, and up to this time, it had been just very, you know, and I'm like, and she's, like, leading me around going this and that, and I stopped right there, and she said, she looked at me, and I said, oh, my God, that's Pete Best. And she said, you like the Beatles? I'm like, what? <laughs> I love the Beatles. Are you crazy? <laughs> and she said, well, let me, uh, let's go downstairs for a minute. I got to show you something. We went downstairs, went in this room. She had a 10 by 10 room, Beatles room. Me- oh, my God. Everything Beatles. Oh. Had the, like the, this ultimate biography of the Beatles. That's, it's a two volume, first volume written. And I was like, God, that book, I've been th- hearing about this book. You know, she yeah. said, take it. What? She gave me this, and that's, yeah. I mean, the woman turned out to be a Beatles freak. Wow, that is so cool. Beatles. I love this town. Here's to the Beatles. Here's to the Beatles, and here's to Austin. Yeah. Hell yeah, no, man. No, I'm, I'm not doing it for Austin. Okay, here's to the Beatles. Yeah. Okay, there we go. And Austin. Yeah. <laughs> Sucker. Okay, I'm sorry, but let's go ahead. Psych. Okay, it's number sorry, six for me. This is your number. Um, yep. Yeah, okay. Taff Falco Pantherphobia. Ooh. Okay. From the mastermind of the Panther Burns comes an album done later in life for Taff Falco and recorded by Monsieur Jeffrey Evans. This is Memphis that I know and love. The Memphis that has blues being played with a punk attitude in a bar underneath an overpass at four in the morning while drinking cold beers without a care in the world. Mm-mm-mm. So I yeah, am a right. huge fan of Tav Falco and the Panther Burns, mm-hmm. right? But this one was quoted by my friend Jeffrey Evans from 68 Comeback Gibson Brothers, right? And, and Jeffrey told me, he goes, he, he, he even said this, he goes, you know, it's sort of like Tav and Ross Johnson and before that, Jim Dickinson were the guys in the Memphis area, right? And then came Jeffrey Evans and, you know, and, and Oblivions and all that. And... So Tav wanted to record something, and Jeffrey goes, to be honest with you, Brian, he goes, I thought when Tav would show up to record it, and Tav's made a bunch of records, right, and, you know, good ones, not so good ones, um, but it's also, like, bad record deals and shit like that. It could be jaded. Jeffrey thought that when he showed up, he might not really be wanting to do this or might give it a half effort or something. He goes, Brian, this guy walked in, and he was so prepared with every song he wanted to play he goes, he had it down tight as shit. He goes, it was the greatest recording session he's ever done. He said, Tab just nailed every song. And my favorite song is, She Wants to Touch My Monkey. You know, it's just like, he, but, he, you know, but Tab, I told you, he's the guy that went out back in the day in Memphis. He went out to the, to the old juke joints, and he has apparently videotape of all these great, like Junior and RL and, Fred, Mississippi Fred McDowell, he apparently has all this stuff, you know, and everything is pretty crazy. But this Panther Phobia is one of the greatest rock and roll, rockabilly, just raunch music you'll ever hear in your whole life. Wow. Yeah. Panther Phobia is a record you should totally get. Put that on your must buy list. By the way, my birthday is Friday. So if anyone wants to send me that, your birthday is Friday? It's Friday, so just go ahead and... Your birthday is what? What day? March 26th. The same as Leonard Nimoy. Wow. So are we in the same... Are you an Aries? Peace, love, and prosperity. Are you an Aries? you goddamn right I am. Well, the reason I say that, my birthday is April 6th. Oh, it is? Yeah. Aries. Fellow Aryans. Dude! No, let's wait. Aries. Sorry, not Aryans. Aries. <laughs> 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 Wait. <laughs> hey, how <I'm> Vulcan. <laughs> really, seriously. Seriously. You know what's always pissed me off about my birthday? What? You know whose birthday is April 25th? What? Aretha Franklin. Ah, oh, shit. You know who's 26? What? Leonard Nimoy. Ah. Uh, you know who's April 6th? Clevo O'Neill. <laughs> Ooh, that's the best one. <laughs> 
Whoa. Who else is I did not know. I did not know that our birthdays were so close to each other. When I asked the question, who else's birthday is on April 6th, everybody says, who cares? (laughs) Except Cleve O'Neill goes, fuck y'all. It's mine. It's mine. (laughs) Cleve will fucking dat your eye. Boom, boom, boom. (laughs) Cleve was like, I love the Fred Sanford fist. It was Fred Sanford. I knew that you got that. I know that you like little pinkies out. Who wrote that theme song? Who? Quincy Jones. Really? Oh, yeah. That guy. You know that guy smoked some of those badass fucking weed you'll ever get in your whole life? Do not ever smoke weed with Quincy Jones. Have you? No, but my friends have. Oh. And they tell me that Quincy's got weed that will put you in the dirt. Oh, what do you expect? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, Quincy Jones is a guy that, like, you know, he was Frank Sinatra's band leader. Yes, yes, I yeah. did know that. Yeah. And you yeah. know what? I'm going to do, I'm going to set, I don't like Frank. I don't love Frank. Okay. I, okay. I but you. I'm going to, I want to set the record about, okay. straight about Frank. Okay. Because Quincy Jones, I saw him say this in that documentary about him, where he said he was Frank Sinatra's band leader, the band that was back in Frank in mm-hmm. Las Vegas, mm-hmm. was. Led by Quincy Jones, the yeah. orchestra, mm-hmm. and they couldn't stay in Caesar's Palace or where. Oh, because they're bl- oh, wow, because yeah. they're black. Yeah. Oh my God! And like Frank was like, "How's you stay at the hotel? You know, how'd you stay at the hotel? <laughs> High balls." Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And he's like, "Oh, it's okay." He's like, "Well, I didn't see you." He's like, "Well, you know, we're not staying in this hotel." He's like, "Why not?" He's like, "Well, they won't let us." I'm like, what? Yeah, we have to stay over here. It's like, why? It's because we're black. And Frank said. Called like the he said, I'm not playing another fucking note here. Wow! I will not play another show at this place unless these guys are put in this hotel. Oh my god! You see, you need people like that to do that. You know, you know. If I'm not, I think it was Lefty Frizzell. I'm not sure, but when Charlie Pry came out in country west music, they didn't know he was black, right? When somebody found his black. This one record, this one uh, radio station said, oh, we're not playing any more of his music. I think it was Lefty Frizzell. I think it was. Called them up and they said, or, or Lefty or uh, who did, uh, wait a minute, who did. Uh, who, they, not Roy Acuff. No, 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 not Roy Acuff. Ernest who, Tubb. Who did, uh, who did Willie play with for a while? Waylon. Nah, before Waylon. It was some before Waylon. Paul uh, English. Nah, uh, I can't. Uh, I, Leon Russell. Now, I can't remember. Cowboy Copas. Yeah, well, I can't remember. Wait, Delano Roosevelt. Uh, I've, I've just told a terrible story Sorry. here at this point, but uh, but I think it was Lefty, and it might have been I don't know, but whatever Perry it is. Darrow. He called up and he said, "If you don't play, there the guy was. He was a popular, popular guy. He goes, if you won't play Charlie Pride, Pride, Pride's records, then you won't play my frickin' records.' And they're like, "What?" And he goes, "That's it. That's the way it is." And so they were like, oh, okay, and they had to stop, and they started playing Charlie Pride's and playing his and everybody because, you know, God damn it, I can't even get into this stuff. It just pisses me off so bad that people are like, The reason I laugh oh. is because, like, there's, you know, Charlie Pride told stories of, like, you know, him walking out on stage somewhere, and they're like, the crowd's like, wet. <laughs> Because because they, they said you didn't. That's before they, you they, could they, get on YouTube. They purposely it. did not put his picture on record like, <laughs> yeah, on the on the albums, no, no. right? Didn't do it. So when he came out and said, people were just like, "What?" Kiss an angel, good morning. Oh, I mean, the guy's amazing. Wasn't that his song? Kiss an yeah, angel, yeah, yeah, good yeah. No, the guy's just amazing. So I just, <laughs> I just, I just love him. He was the best. Yeah. Okay, was that yours or me? I thought you just did. Um, did I do Taff? I did you Taff. You did Taff. There so you this go. is my number five. Oh, I'm trying to cut in line. Look at me. Look at me. Yeah, well, you know. I said, look at me. York. Look at me. Look. Sorry, Cleve. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Cleve. I, I, all roads lead to Cleve. You know what? Tennessee Williams had a famous quote I used to see every now and then in New Orleans. He said, uh, every, town, every town in America is, there are only three cities in America, New York, San Francisco and New Orleans. Everywhere else is Cleveland. Oh, whoa. Yeah, it's pretty harsh, isn't it? It is. Well, Tennessee, uh, okay. Uh, really? I can't believe that he would be snipey. You know what Truman Capote, you know what Truman Capote said about Jack Kerouac's writing? It's just like vomiting on, this, on, on paper. He said, that's not writing. That's typing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever seen the uh, the whole the original script that he did? Who? Kerouac for on what? the road. On the road. No. 
He taped. Oh, it's on the like, run along. Yeah. yeah, he taped pieces of paper together yeah. in the original. It's crazy. Yeah, it's like on a long roll. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's what happens when you do benzos. Get me some. You got them. Send them. You got them. Benzos. Our way. Benzos. C O Cleve O'Neill dot com. Cleve O'Neill will come get them. Post. Yeah. P O Box six six six. P O Box. Devil's Anus, Texas. Alcatraz, Devil's Anus, Texas. Alcatraz, <laughs> California. <laughs> Hello, the name is Catraz. Alcatraz. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> You're Alcatraz? Yep. Nobody ever escaped me. Don't let that fucking story fool you. Yeah, I know I got out of that. Oh, here's my number five. Okay. It's a soundtrack to the movie The Harder They Come. Various artists featuring Jimmy Cliff, Toots and the Maytals. This soundtrack album to the movie of the same name was a monumental catalyst and showing the world what Jamaica had to offer when it came to great music. Kaboom! That song, that, that album really did break open yeah. uh, the whole world when it came to reggae. And not just reggae, but like um, deeper than Bob Marley. Mm -hmm. You know, Jimmy Cliff, Toots and the Maytals, uh, the Slick. just died recently, right? Who? Man, I thought for that Bill Hicks, Could get out of here. Toots Hibbert just died. Didn't he just die recently? Toots, yeah. Yeah. And it was a good movie. It's a, you know, Jimmy Cliff is in this movie called The Harder They Come. Or is it The Harder They Fall? Harder They Come. Yeah, Harder They Come. Have you ever seen it? No. And the reason, it's funny you said that because, to be honest with you, until about three days ago, I really wasn't aware of this movie. And something came up on something I was looking at, came up, and I was like, what is this? And I started looking into it literally three days ago. It's funny you say that because they were saying, like, if you want to know a, a movie about Jamaica and music, this is what you need to watch. The movie's good. Yeah. The soundtrack's excellent. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it's I, got, uh, you know, The Harder They Come. It's got mm -hmm. uh, uh, Pressure Drop, Oh, Pressure Drop, Oh, Pressure Got the Drop on You. Man. It's got a ton of like good stuff. Uh, I mean, Jimmy Cliff, The Harder They Come, uh, Many Rivers to Cross. These are classic, classic songs. Oh, that, yeah. As it turns out, you know, like in the, in the reggae pantheon. It's beyond reggae, really. It's, it's like, a, you know, it's the, the whole, you know, it's rock steady. It's oh, yeah. All that stuff, you know, uh. in there together. And, um, man, a great thrill of my life was uh, 2012. Like, I had just quit my job. I was moving to Costa Rica. Yeah. So I quit. I strategically quit my job like the day before South by Southwest started. Yeah. And I had a flight out to Costa Rica like two days after South by Southwest ended. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I was free. Yeah. And Jimmy Cliff was the like the big name uh -huh. that year. And so I got to see Jimmy Cliff like three times. I oh, never really? thought I'd ever get to see Jimmy Cliff. Wow. And I first saw him like in the at the Four Seasons Hotel, like oh that seven, that morning yeah, that morning yeah. deal on and he K was just there with a, a, a KGSR like a, a bass player and a yeah. percussionist. Had many rivers to cross. Uh, the harder they come, oh, we did the whole man. Oh, uh, it was just yeah, man. I mean, uh, and I didn't. I discovered that record after I moved to Austin. You uh -huh. know, like somebody, and I'm like, that's the real primer. That is the primer for like reggae. And oh. um, yeah, that's the real. Get on to that, and you'll you'll sort of that'll that's the. And that it pains me here to hear that because this should be South by Southwest right now. You know what we're doing here. Yeah, we this, should we should not be doing this right now. We should be. We should be out in the street. We should be out in the street or in yeah. an alley. Yeah, in yeah. an alley. Yeah, in an especially alley. in an alley. Yeah. yeah, we should be doing that for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Okay, is that my number five? Yep. Number five. Sonic Youth Daydream Nation. It's a double album of pure NYC noise pop that assaulted and soothed my ear holes. From the alternative tunings to the squalling feedback, it's a noise that can soothe a soul. I don't know if you've ever heard this album. I actually have heard this yeah, album. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, uh, I bought it, and to be honest with you, I bought a couple Sonic Youths before that, and I didn't really get them because it was more like art noise to me. And when I got that one, it was like, oh, my God. I mean, it blew my mind that they could do 
this double album and pull this off and make all this, like say, and all these alternative tunings and everything, and but but pull it together in a way that was melodic, because you have a real when you start getting into alternative tunings and and what they were doing, it can become just very noisy. Period. You know, and um, but this one just blew my blew my brain. I yeah. just was like, and um, many many years after that, they came to a club in Dallas called Club Clearview, and my friend Dickie was there. My friend Bob who watches this, it's his brother. And, uh, and he and I, we'd been, uh, we'd actually been to this, uh, I've been to a punk rock, I've been to see, uh, who is it, uh, Soundgarden be a, be a middle act the week before. And they patted me down and made sure I had no, no weapons and poured on my beer in plastic cups because it was going to be crazy. We come to this show and they're like, here you go, have a bottle. And so Dickie and I were talking about this, how we got patted down for these other shows, and we're at the front of the stage with a bottle of beer going, well, I guess Sonic Youth is kind of mellowed out or something, I guess, because they let us have bottles here. So we get up there. As soon as, as, soon as Sonic Youth comes out, Lee Ronaldo goes right up to the fucking mic. He goes, hardcore fucking rules. And they just start going, what? Doing this stuff. And bottles just start flying. And Dickie and I just start going, fuck this. <laughs> we just like booking back to the back. Because we're like, holy shit, they just went after. But this one here, I mean, they did goo and all these other ones later on. They were amazing. But Daydream Nation, to me, just blew my mind. And it's not an album, to be honest with you, to play on a sunny day like today. It's an album that should be played on a kind of a dreary day, in my opinion, uh, kind of a dreary day because it just sort of it just sort of feels right for uh, a lower barometric pressure and some clouds in the sky and all that stuff. It's just uh, it blows my mind. It's an alt rock classic. It is. It is. It is. Yeah. So that one just like I just was like, holy crap. Yeah. I just. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Good choice. So that's my number cinco. Awesome. What's your number cuatro? Going to get in some familiar territory. Kiko and the Lavender Moon by Los Lobos. Oh. Yeah. This, in that, this enigmatic work of genius defies categories and established the Wolves as one of the greatest American bands of all time. Come! Boom! No, you can't. We've already done a whole show on these guys. <laughs> you know, I mean, what else do you say? I mean, there's one of the greatest American bands, period. And like I said, I don't give a fuck about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but if you've got a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the fuck that those guys on in there is a, is a whore. If Janet Jackson's in there, yeah, they ought to be in there. I kept searching for the... David Hidalgo. A certain word, for the, a certain uh, adjective. And I finally settled on enigmatic for that record. Yeah. Because, which enigmatic means it's mysterious and hard to, like, figure out. And I think that record's a real puzzle. It's very cryptic. It's got, you know there's a message in there. There's messages in there. It's up to you to feel it and decipher it. You know, like J Two Janes, you know, uh, the thing about when the rail, when the circus comes to town. I mean, it's... It's well, let, man, it was just like a quantum, like they were going along as a classic, you know, like a kind of an Americana band with Mexican, you know, that kind of gr perfect blend of like, yeah. And then all of a sudden, kaboom, they come out with this thing, which is like, you know, I mean, Brunel. I, I think, uh, Brunel, he was like a French surrealist ah, director, really? Yeah, look at that, Carl Malone. To Brunel. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I have to look that up. Brunel, a French what? He was like a, a French uh, film director and known for his uh, like surrealist kind of. Oh. Yeah. I have to look that up. See, I love this. I learn shit. Fuck all y'all. I learn stuff. <laughs> right. There's no Clevo, need to like. Clevo there's learn. no need Clevo to like hate on them. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'm out of here. You're right. You shouldn't. I shouldn't. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was caught up in the moment. You see what I'm, working with uh, here. I'm sorry. I was caught up in the moment a little bit. I, I apologize. 
I am a punk. I, I got caught up. I love all y'all. Clevo, Clevo, Clevo was very, very sorry. Clevo is very sorry in his third person world. And uh, so I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> I, yeah, Carl Malone's not going to deliver any more of the Clevo material in his, uh, in his uh, 18 wheelers anymore. So I need a new distributor, basically, is what I'm trying to say. So uh, I apologize. I know you're doing a number one. I'm, I'm pretty sure there was a vandal. I apologize. All right, number four. Number Wait, four. Number four. N numero cuatro from Cleve O'Neill. Cleve O'Neill, Gibson Brothers, Memphis Del Sol. Wow. I know that you don't like the Gibson Brothers, but straight out of Memphis came an album recorded in one drunken night at Sun Studios, and you hear the effects of the alcohol the album plays complete with fights in the parking lot, giving hookers a lift on the way to get a pizza to a debaucherous naked party. Monsieur Jeff Evans, John Spencer's, and Ross Johnson create some of the coolest punk blues you'll ever hear. One of the greatest fucking albums ever made, Gibson Brothers, Memphis Del Sol. I love that fucking record. I know you don't, you're not... Did you see them live, or what did you did you see them or hear them? I did see them live. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was it's literally the worst. I know. I can get that. It really is. I can they get that. I can get that. I mean, but I had a, but I had to. I, I had get to that. Give some brothers record that, that I that I liked. I mean, was that's it, why I was couch see dancing or what do you? I don't, I, know. I don't know. I no. mean, I, they were coming. They, to me, they, they you know I lumped them in with like the Flat Duo Jets and Chickasaw Mud Puppies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I saw Chickasaw Mud Puppies when I was tripping on acid one night. Oh man, they were really great. Oh yeah, but yeah, it could have been the acid. But yeah, well, it's like I love this kid one time. He goes, "Hey man, raves are cool when you're on acid." I'm like, "Hey, cleaning out your closet's cool when you're on acid." It's hey, like, you know my buddy Mike, <laughs> who's not listening, uh, he told me he said Mike kind of talks like Mike Brown used to. He uh, he said. Uh, you know, I've been to see the Grateful Dead two times. He said, once I was tripping on acid and once I wasn't. He said, guess which time was better? <laughs> <laughs> now, I've seen the Grateful Dead one time. You did? One time. And here's what I can tell you about the Grateful Dead. I wasn't tripping on acid when I saw them. And, the, and I'm not a Grateful Dead fan by any stretch of the yeah, imagination. I strike me as no, I do. I'm like, fuck all. Whatever, whatever, whatever. whatever. But... I'll say this much. The Grateful Dead knows their audience because most bands, the light shines on the band. But the Grateful Dead would have the lights and they would wind up periodically flipping out into the crowd. And when they did, everybody in acid, as soon as the lights were out, you're a collective. <laughs> Every time, man, they did it about five times. And it was so freaking awesome to hear the place go, whoa. I mean, I was in tears, man. But now I'm not. I'm not the biggest fan. But I know that you like like the the the, the Gibson Brothers. But I, Monsieur Jeff Evans is one of my best friends. I just love the guy to death. I'm a big fan. He has Ross Johnson. Know him, big fan. John Spencer's. I wish I knew him. Um, but they just made this crazy record where they literally did it in Sun Records, Sun Studios. They did it all night. In the middle, of the, in the middle of, the, of recording it, Jeff, drinking, leaves with his girlfriend to go drive across town. He goes, I don't know what the fuck, but I want to drive across town. He goes, I need a pizza from across Memphis. And they get in this car. They go across there. Some girl flags him down. They give her a ride. She goes, oh, I need a ride. And they give her a ride, and the cops pull him over, and they're going, you're giving a ride to a hooker. And they're going, what? She just needs a ride to a place. And they're going, she's a hooker. And she's like, no, no, I'm not a hooker. So... They let him go, and they drop her off at some, like, just deserted area. They're like, what the fuck? But they want him getting their pizza, come back into the parking lot. John Spencer's is out there waiting for Jeff to come back, gets pissed. John and Jeff get into a fucking fight out in the parking lot, have to go back inside, keep recording the records. They're still drinking. It culminates in this song called The Naked Party, where Ross is the only guy that can sing. So if you listen to this record from beginning to end, it is just debauchery at its finest, just going down the line. It's awesome. All right. So I just gave you some insight that nobody else knows about. There you go. Clevo, Clevo, Clevo can help you with that stuff. Is there a connection between them and, like, Jay Retard? 
Yeah, well, well Jay's from there Memphis. Has to be. Yeah, they're from. They're Besides all from Memphis. That, I, mean, yeah. I know they're all from Memphis. Yeah, yeah. Now they. Uh, no, I, I know they're from Memphis. Yeah, now Jay, you tell me, I'm from Memphis. I know Jay is awesome. He, you know, he, he, he dead? yeah, he, he died of a cocaine overdose. Well, that's a way to go. Yeah, I know. I mean, if you're a fucking rock star. Yeah, Jay, Jay retard, and I gotta tell you, I told you that story, didn't I? Uh, yeah. About him. About being Jay honest. retard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did this thing. Yeah. Whenever yeah. I tell you, when I met Jay, he was nice as hell to me, but he loved Jeff Evans. So he wasn't going to be a dick around Jeff Evans, right? When I met Jay, he was tons nice. But even Ross, who did not like, who did not like Jay Evans, I mean, uh, Jay Retard at all. Jay Retard. He said, he said, man, that guy, he, that guy actually mixed uh, Ross's records. That guy could mix records. He was, he was fucking brilliant. I mean, Jay was fucking brilliant. But he was just this tortured soul, unfortunately. You yeah, know, well, you know that's art for you. It is. It, it claims the best. So on to number three for you. Document by R E M. Okay, okay. You can take your twenty bucks back. We have no, no, we, that we, was have, last we week. have two of the same bands. That was last week. That's for last week time. Yeah. Document was my co-pilot on about a million miles drinking beer on backwoods country roads, trying to figure out how to get there from here. Oh, that is awesome. <laughs> Oh you my God. God! Oh, you did! Oh, oh you did! No, you did! You did! No, you did! You did. You did. <laughs> Kaboom! <laughs> no, you did! Uh, talk with the hand. Oh man, that's great. Oh my God! I can't. You know my love for that man. Yeah. I just. You that's know. the one. You know, that's the. They did ten, twelve great records. Oh yeah. Fables but that's, are, that's almost, the one. To I, me, that's that was the one. I, I almost just, pulled. I almost pulled in Fables of the Reconstruction, you know, because yeah. that's dark and everything. And uh, yeah, I just. To I me, mean, that spoke to me in a real, you know, that I mean, because those guys, those they were seriously talking about something. Finest work song is oh, like yeah. the time to rise has been engaged. Oh yeah, Better, you know, it's like. You just like there's a philosophy behind that. Oh yeah, now those that band, you know, they're they're big heroes of mine. Yeah. I just because like we've talked about this before about how these guys go. Okay, Peter Buck and Mike go. Okay, we've seen what what tears bands up. It's all the 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 you know the rights and everything. They go, we're splitting everything four ways. That's what we're doing. Right. And I think that made them just make great music there was nobody was going i got to do more than whatever they just go if one's kind of falling down the other one's going i know this other one's got me and back and forth and all that and yeah well you're gonna love this then my number three are you a murmur (laughs) (laughs) yes you couldn't make this up that you did that one the sound of this album was something that should accompany a flannery o'connell novel from the sepia tone Kutza cover to the mumbled lyrics to the danceability of the song, this is a new take on Southern Gothic sound. Yep. Amen. So, yeah. So I'm I, right ju- that. I just, you know, those guys, you and I are in total agreement on that. Absolutely. Man, I mean, I just can't, you know, later on, it got a little more poppy, but what they did off the bat was a sound that I had never heard. Uh, it just had this weird, and it had to do a lot with Mitch Easter and uh, all those guys that were producing it. They 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 did a really good job with that too. They really were able to capture them, but those guys just had this this sound and just this whole deal. Just I don't. I, well, that's I, another that like that's another. Uh, when I first heard, I know where I, I vaguely where and what was going on when I heard Radio Free Europe for oh. the first time. My God. I was riding. I was living in Tennessee, and I was driving a van. I was delivering candy or some bullshit. And, I, you know, and it was it was a, like a foggy, gray day. Yeah. And I was driving past, like, you know, some gullies with kudzus, and that song came on. Oh, my God. And I'm God. like, God damn, this is like the soundtrack for exactly what. You're doing. And it didn't sound like, you know, it didn't sound like nothing else. No, no. Yeah, yeah. That was a, that's, that's a, thing, a good one. That thing got me is like, they did have a sound that nobody else had, 
And it was because of Easter and all those guys that producing it and everything, and they were like, you know, setting them up. But it's also because the band just was like, we, you know, they just they're unique. They're very, very individual uh, on that stuff. And well, they and, were thinking they were they were you know they embodied you t- you met Fla- you you mentioned Flannery O'Connor. They were certainly influenced by Flannery O'Connor. And, and, they were influenced by William Faulkner. And and every southern, and like, they were influenced by all those outsider artists because yeah, yeah. one of their one of oh, their yeah. one of their videos is at uh, one of them's at uh, uh, Aria Miller's uh, windmill place, and one of them is at uh, at uh, the uh, Garden of Eden uh, by uh, I can't think of his name here. All of a sudden, I'm like zoning out here. The Garden of Eden. Garden of <laughs> exactly. Don't no, think Finster Howard Finster's Garden of Eden, and they had they had that there, so they knew all this. Southern, gothic. Southern Gothic stuff that was out there that that you know a lot of people would drive past this stuff and go, "What's that piece of trash doing out here?" And they're like, "Oh my God, this is just incredible stuff." Yeah, yeah. I mean, because you you can take from Finster and then go out to you know who is like the most incredible that being uh, you know Thornton Dial and Jamie Lee Suddeth. and uh, and those guys with their Southern outsider art. And if you ever want to look at some names, I am. You got to look up. Are these these are visual? These are painters. Painters. Uh, so uh, Jimmy Lee Suddeth painted with mud, and uh, and uh, Thornton. What's mud? Mud. Oh, oh, the medium. The medium. No, here. Did I tell you about the time that I mud? Did I tell you when I hung out with with uh, Jimmy? Yeah, yeah. He yeah. did that thing. With yeah, the yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. So I mean, these guys is all this stuff, and those. R.E.M. understood all that and embraced all that and brought it to the forefront. And I guarantee you they they got something out of that to bring this weird vibe to their music. But yet, very danceable, real pop, very cool. Well, the rhythm section, that, that's what made that pop. Rhythm that's section? That's what made it dance pop. You know, that's, yeah. I told you, I, told you, I don't know if I... Like I, I think I think I talked to you about about uh, about yeah about how you know Bill Berry was like did a disco beat yeah you yeah know, kind you of like hear that. that real urgency to it yeah 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 heard of a guy named uh, George Hunt out of Memphis no, he was a uh-uh. visual no uh, he was one of those primitive art kind of guys oh really and, yeah he was he would do the posters for Memphis in May every year my cousin was a friend of his anyway he was one of those guys he was one of those like you know what you're talking about right there I love it yeah okay Dulce number two. My number two album, Astral Weeks by Van Morrison. I've listened to this album a bunch, (laughs) hundreds of times, and still can't describe its ineffable qualities or the way it stirs whatever Irish blood is coursing through my veins. Oh, man. You fucking bastard! Kaboom! Look at that. (laughs) Perfect. He wants to be in the floral arrangement. Did that surprise you? Astral Weeks, Van Morrison? No, no, not at all, not at all. Really? No, 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 because I'm, I'm a big Van Morrison fan. You like that record? Yes, I love it. Yeah. I would want to hang out with Van Morrison, but I love that record. <laughs> Probably not. I've told you about the guy that ran... Uh, oh, yeah, that guy, he did the thing with and the stuff. There we go, that's it. I know uh, who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Slim Jim. What? Yeah. Eddie Wilson. Yeah, Slim Jim, Eddie Wilson. <laughs> You learned how to shut me up. Hey, have I told you about? Yeah, I, yeah, I heard that. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know they got it. Yeah, for real. Cremo stops talking right now. But no, Astro works. <laughs> no, because Astro works. Uh, you know. Yeah. So talk to me about that. Well, I mean, you know, you know how that was. That was Van's. Uh, you know, that was that weird record he did with those. Uh, they were like jazz musicians. Yeah. You know, and they didn't like. They didn't even know the songs, or he didn't even talk yeah, to he them. He probably didn't talk to them. No. He probably didn't care. And they were these, you know, playing these. Um, I mean, it's a cult classic. Yeah, right? you yeah. know, it's a. Very did he or- didn't even sing to? The, did he even face him when he sang it in the? No, studio? I think he was like in a just by himself, like you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. often they were just because he was always turning were, his back on everybody. I mean, it's just got some of his great vocal performances on it, which is like, that's saying something. Well, and it's very, it's just, I mean, I just, you know, I heard that at a certain time, you know, and I was like reading like Yates and 
you yeah. know, like trying to read James Joyce and like the whole Irish thing because I'm certain that I spent a former life in Ireland. Ah. Yeah. You bloody one. fucking bastard. Well, why do you say that to me in a British accent? Oh, you go fuck yourself, <laughs> you fucking hoser. <laughs> you bloody wanker. You blouse wearing poodle walker. You're like me when I try to do an accent. I'm like the worst. <laughs> you know, I had this buddy, you know, there used to be this bar called Mother Egan's. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I asked the guy, like the owner was from Ireland. I'm like, hey, man, what is the big deal with you and that English? And he's like, I don't want to get into it too much. He said, but I will say this. You know the old saying, the sun never sets on the English empire? And I said, yeah. He said, you know what it means? I'm like, what? He said, you can't trust the fuckers in the dark. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah well, they didn't have a very good relationship. And if I don't go to Ireland before I'm dead, I'm really going to be disappointed. I get you. I get you. I want to go there so bad. Let's take, uh, well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to take uh, Racon Teresa to Ireland. Ooh. Dublin, 2021. There we are. There we are. Okay. Number two for me. Number two for you. Minutemen double nickels on the dime. I knew you were going to have a Minutemen. You know what? You know what? This double album made for an astonishing $2,300 was labeled punk because it was on the SST records, but more so because no one can categorize this outstanding sound of jazz chords, tenor riff, thumping bass, hi-hat swinging drums, and political lyrics. They should just call it great fucking music. There you go. I am the biggest fan of the Minutemen. I love this band. That's right. I love what they did. I love these guys started in San Pedro. They did stuff. They did music. They, they, they didn't, they were not like anybody else, not like anybody else. My, my best thing to say about them, my friend Mary, who was in a Congo Novel, this band said the first time, they showed the Minuteman. She goes, she's at a bar in, in Hollywood. And she was talking to somebody. She's drinking a beer, facing the bar. And she goes, she hears them come on. And she goes, and I just turned around because I'd never heard anything like that. Because these guys were labeled punk because they're on SST, which is Greg Ginn, Black Flag, right? But Greg Ginn, Black Flag just liked them. But they were more like this weird jazz pop, this odd Odd stuff, but they're singing shit about Sandinistas and Nicaragua and all this sort of stuff that nobody was, like, talking about. And these guys were from San Pedro, California, and totally worldly political and um, just crazy. So, yeah. I mean, I just... But the fact that a double album is made for $2,300, so what they did is they recorded it off hours. Everything was done off hours, like from midnight to 6 in the morning, so they didn't have to pay that much money. They did it on used tapes. Uh, they, I think they, I think it's 48, 48 songs on the whole album. If you get the CD, it's 45. The, the vinyl's 48 records, 48 songs. I think they mixed all of them in one night, mixed the whole 48 in one night. Wow. That shit, amazing. that shit's awesome. Hey, I want to, before we get to number one. Yeah. I want to do something. Yeah. I want to... I want to guess what your number one out you, band's going to be. You can probably figure that out. No, I'm going to write it. I want you to write, and I want you to write what you think mine's going to be, and don't... Okay, okay. I'm going to write just the band, or just the artist. Oops. Okay. And then we'll see. Uh, we'll put it out here. Here's mine. Yeah, that way it's... Okay. Oh, boy, are we ready? Yeah. Here's my number one. Yeah. The album is Infinity. The band is Journey. <laughs> <laughs> this collection of multi-millionaire, <laughs> pre, pre-planned beats and hops by season session studio okay, musicians. That's it. Ron Carrillo. Ron, Ron is <laughs> over. It's over. This whole podcast is bullshit. It's done. Enjoy it. Nine subscribers. We're sorry. Sorry. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> yes. That, yes. That was awesome. <laughs> oh, 
Well, I, I'm like, how long am I going to have to wait before it, <laughs> Brian cracks? Like, goes berserk. <laughs> oh, my God. Number one album, Texas Flood by Stevie Ray Vaughan. <laughs> I picked the meters. That's, that's not a bad guess. Is there any better way to describe this jaw-dropping debut by the legendary Texas gunslinger than the words of his brother Jimmy when he said, he plays guitar like he's breaking out of jail. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, my God. That guy, that guy, that's, you know, he's the reason I live in Austin. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Stevie. Yeah. It was, I mean, I don't know what to say about Stevie. No. The guy meant a fucking ton to me. Oh, I get it. Yeah. I totally get it. I mean, the guy, well, my favorite story about him is that when he said after he quit doing drugs, he was always like, which anybody who's an artist thinks that doing something that kind of fucks you up is going to, was what's going to get you somewhere. And we quit drinking and doing drugs. He, he said he felt like gloves came off his hands. And you're going, what? Because he was playing amazing. Yeah. Wasted. Right. You know, you know, because like th there's there's th th a perfect example. There's two Austin City Limits. Are you talking about the one where he changes that guitar in the middle of it? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw him do that. Like, oh, you did. I, I saw Stevie like eight or nine times. Uh huh. And uh -huh. it was always so. I was living in Tennessee, but he would come through Memphis once a year. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, me and my cousin Bill would go see him every single time he was there. I told the you know the first time I saw him I think I told that story about being at the thing with the people and the deal and the yeah other fucking, yeah and um, but as it got like as the years grew on it just kept getting to be bigger and bigger venues yeah and um, the last time I saw him was at Mud Island and the Stray Cats oh, that is, opened yeah. for him really yeah wow and um, hell of a bill yeah. And the Stray Cats open, and the, the cool thing, the Stray Cats, like, the you know, the PA's playing music. Yeah. And uh, they were playing, uh, well, a race is on, and here comes pride at the George. back, George. Yeah. And, like, in the middle of the song, the Stray Cats walked on, picked up their instruments, they faded the PA, and the Stray Cats finished the race is on. Oh, my I've God. I've never seen that before. Oh, my God. I've never seen that ever happen. Wow. I haven't either. That's yeah. a great way to start a show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, they played their set awesome. Um, Stevie, you know, came out, crushed it. And that Mud Island is, if anybody doesn't know, it's, That's right, cool, it's, it's like right on the Mississippi it's River. In, it is a, it's in the island. Mississippi it's River. It's kind of an island. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, like, during uh, Stevie's encore, he was playing like a love struck baby. Yeah. And, uh, you could see Brian Setzer was standing on the side of the stage. Yeah. Standing there and like Stevie's like playing and he does that doodle doodle goes over and he just takes his guitar and hands it to Brian Setzer. Oh my God. And puts it around his shoulders. And Brian Setzer comes out and starts trying to play the solo and it's those, you talk about Dick Dale. Dick Strings, but yeah. This, and Brian Setzer's like, I play sevens, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And he's trying, and he's just looking at Steve. I mean, he looked at Stevie like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and Stevie's like, over there like, yeah, play it, motherfucker. <laughs> no, man, Stevie to me, uh, I mean, there's something, there's, you know, there'll always be something special to yeah. me about Stevie. I don't know what it is. He had the X factor. He had this kind of just plugged into. It's that romantic thing, man. Yeah. You know, I totally get it. I, uh, you know, you're talking about, Sets are, it's funny, I bought a VHS type one time of all the, all these guitar players and their riffs, right? It was like Danny Gatton and all these cats and everything. And they're all real specific, like, well, this is a, uh, this is a uh, minor pentatonic, you know, or mixolydian scale and all this stuff. And there was a port on there where Brian Setzer gets on, he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't know what this is. It's just a deal where you go, and then you go, wing, 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 and you, and that's it. Yeah. And I was like, I was cracking up because everybody else is so exact. And he's just like, ah, he gets out no, of Brian there. Brian Setzer is a fantastic guitar player. Oh, he's a killer guitar yeah, player. Yeah. Killer. If you, and by the way, if you, you know, Stevie Ray, go look at the old, you know, it is funny because you go look at the, there's a um, live at El Macombo. 
El Macambo? He did a, that's okay. a, in Canada. It's like a little club in Canada okay. when he was okay. just coming out. And uh, may go look at that and you'll see, I mean, it's like, it's off the chain. Yeah. Guitar playing. Yeah. And then like, you know, by the time he came on Ace Austin City Limits the second time, he yeah. was sober. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it was just, I mean, it was night and day. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it wasn't, it, it was better in a way. Yeah. He was just super tight and like, you know, he was obviously happy. Yeah. And like, you know, like, God damn it, I'm free of all that shit. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's the, you know, and that's the thing. That Stevie Ray Vaughan had an epic life. He did. He did. You know what I mean? The guy went clean and he was probably on his, and then he fucking gets killed. He got killed. God damn it. I mean, there's there's never day. a good time to die, obviously, but he died at a point where it's like, oh, man. Anybody who, who, who gets music, who gets addiction, understands that, like, that was just beyond horrible. And that was a sad day in Austin when that happened. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, that was flags at half mast kind of thing. Oh, yeah. No, it was because you can't get better than that guy, you know. Okay, Brian, number one. Okay, who do you think I, who do you think I said? I, I'm pretty no, much, no. Say it first. You're gonna no. I'm gonna turn it. The replacements, let it be. Son of a bitch, Wilco. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have Wilco on the whole I thing. I should have known that was a replace. I should have known. Go I ahead. know, yeah, but it's pretty good guess. Good guess. No, the replacements, let it be. The first time I played this album, the drunken bluesy pop tunes that came out was just the gumbo my soul needed, with heartfelt lyrics of unrequited love to young love, to getting a boner, nothing was off limits and all was done to perfection. This album, the first time I played it, blew my fucking mind. That blew my fucking mind. And it was just because, I think at that time I was a, I've told you like in college I was a big drinker. And, um, and something to hear these big drunks just go after this stuff. Not only go after it, not in some drunken bullshit way. It was drunken bullshit. But because of Westerberg, it was these crazy, heartfelt, great lyrics that were written out there. Just incredible. Yeah. And it just floored me. Just fucking floored me about how you can do this stuff and pull this off. Yeah. And there was this blues element, which really resonates with me. Um, but like I said, his pop, you know, this one, it's one song, Answer Machine. It's just him playing that guitar, and it's all about him being drunk and fucked up on coke and trying to call this girl up to tell her that he loves her, and he just keeps getting her answer machine, just keeps getting it time after time after time. I mean, it's just it's just incredible. And the REM tie-in is Peter Buck kind of sort of produced the record for him. He plays the mandolin on the first song and everything, and Peter Buck just produced, but he really just hung out with those guys. But it's whole REM, REM replacements, you know, sort of stuff. Now, that one just blew my mind. That, that record is one of those ones. I, I'm like the same with you. That's a record I bought three or four times because it's gotten so damn scratchy. I've had to just go, I got to get another one of these. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. 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 So I just saw it. But, but at the same time, when I read their book, The Trouble Boys, it was really a bummer that come to find out those guys, and I've said this before, how they just sort of basically screwed up every opportunity they ever had. I mean, they just they just ruined every 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 chance they could have gotten bigger. They just ruined it. They just shot it out the door. Just and it was really a, a pisser to read that and know that's what that the deal is. But I guess there's a lot of people out there that are afraid of success. I don't know. I know we're not. We're trying to yeah. get there. No, we're we sucking, get to ten. We're, we're we get sucking, to ten. We're sucking cock for it. That's <laughs> a we shit my eyes. <laughs> back to a call back to nobody knows what that is. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to know where you don't want to know the depths we will plumb for success. And when I say plumb, I mean plumb. Clevo will. Clevo O'Neill will. Clevo O'Neill. <laughs> ten for ten. Ten for ten, baby. Oh, 
Honorable mentions. You got any honorable mentions? Yeah, I do. And, I got a and, shitload. To, and to be honest with you, it's like way too many goddamn many. But I will do them real quick. I'll try to make them fast here. Okay. Honorable mention. The big boys. Skinny or fat Elvis, right? I'll read this real quick. Yeah. More oh, funky yeah. than the Red Hots, as hardcore as Fugazi, and as funky as Cool in the Gang. Big boys were a punk band that thrived on funk and fun. Biscuit, Tim Kerr, Chris Gates jumped in with the music they wanted to play and the fun they wanted to have and dared you to come along with every show ending with You Should Start Your Own Band. It's a band we'll always regret that I never saw. Right. Okay. Another one, Black Top. This comes from Mick Collins of the Dirt Bombs and the Gories, Alex Cuervo from Feast of Snakes, and Darren Lidwood from Fireworks. It starts out with Darren's drug habit, selling the equipment the night before the recording, to Mick blowing out his voice 10 seconds into the first song, to Alex laying down the bass tracks to keep it on track. My other one, Uncle Tupelo, any fucking album you want. These guys invented country punk and heartfelt lyrics that push Americana sound today. Except these guys did it with such an intense push, there's no way they could stay together. Thankfully, thankfully they did it for as long as they could. And then really quick, Class Sandinista, the country and westerns, brand new band, John Spencer's Blues Explosion, anything. Good deal. Yeah. London Calling. London Calling there you Clash. Go. This is where punk met the world and proved that the group's slogan, the only band that matters, was basically true. Yep. Um, Joshua Tree by U2. Yeah. If I die before I make it to Ireland, it'll be a goddamn, it'll be a goddamn shame because I want to drink proper Guinness in a pub and feel the pull of that. We're going, we're going there with War Dublin, 2021. Yeah. 10 by Pearl Jam. Ah. <sighs> Abraxas by Santana, yes. Dreamboat Annie, Heart, Truth, Jeff Beck, a new world record by Electric Light Orchestra Woo! at Fillmore East, the Allman Brothers. Yeah. Are you experienced? The yeah. Jimi Hendrix experience. There we go. Yeah. Well, dude, this is a record for us. We are at two hours. Yo! Right now. You stuck it out this long, you're you, a goddamn bloody. You stuck it out this long, you, you get a free fucking t shirt. If, yeah. you, if you actually are at this point right now, and you go, Brian and Dave, what's, what's, what's a word they need to know to, to cl- cl- uh, Clevo. Clevo. <laughs> Clevo. If you, if you say, I know Clevo. We I will, know Clevo. I know Clevo. We will send you a shirt or our country is a shirt. Send it your size. We'll do that. Put that on the website or on the, uh, on the uh, YouTube right there. Yeah. You know, you look like my favorite Martian right there. <laughs> we are your masters. <laughs> but... That is the longest we've ever done. Yeah. These top tens were really fucking fun. I know. We're going to get back to just talk about one band instead of a billion bands. I don't know. Do we? We don't have no fucking rules. We can do whatever we want. Yeah, that's right. We just made this shit up. Yeah, we're just hanging out here drinking at Chicobra, Texas. Chicobra. You know, it's a lawless little town outside of Austin. Come on, hang out with us. Scorpion Ranch, rocking and rolling. That's right. You got anything else to say, my friend? No, man, that was a lot of fun. It and, was. Uh, go, go out and uh, buy all to these, these records. records. Buy all these yeah. records. And uh, let's go eat some barbecue. There's a place down the road here. Let's go yep. eat some barbecue. All right. There we go. Let's, let's. And we'll listen to the song Barbecue by ZZ Top on the way. Or we could listen to the band Barbecue Killers also on the way. Or maybe both. Yeah. One on the way, one on the way back. There we go. Okay. That's it. All right. We love you guys. Clevo said P out. Clevo out, Clevo out. Adios.